Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. We have a, uh, we've got Jared Simmons on with us tonight. And I know many of you thought it was last night. That was a uh, error on my part. And Colin just copied my error as far, as far as thinking it was on Monday. But it wasn't. It was always going to be on Tuesday. We corrected that a little bit too late. But uh, I'm glad everyone's here today to hang out with us and uh, talk about this hobby that we all love. Yeah. No, you've got the date right tonight, Alberto. Congrats. Uh, you can, remember, you can blame me for that. Um, but hey, Jared's in the green room. Let's bring him in here and uh, welcome him to the show. Hey, Jared. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me on, Bill. I really appreciate it. It's hey, it's my pleasure. I mean, we, uh, you know, obviously you've been a, a CAF member for a long time and uh, we've run into each other a few times at San Diego Comic-Con, but we've never really had the chance to to talk at length. So I figured this was a good opportunity. When And when you bought that artwork, was it like last month? I, you know, it's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you. <laughs> it worked out. You agreed. Thank you. Yeah, no, I've been sitting here since yesterday because I was confused too. So I'm ready to go. <laughs> See, yeah, just so everybody knows, you you know, the, even the chat, we're not the only ones that were confused. So was Jared. And, and again, totally my fault, but uh, but we worked it all out. So, so Jared, um, you know, we were talking in the green room. You're, you're in Arizona. I'm in Florida. So uh, how long have you been in Arizona? Is this, is that like, did you, were you born and raised there or is it a move that brought you to that state? No, it's funny. It's a move that brought me here. My, I, I actually am from Shreveport, Louisiana originally and I grew up there and um, then my father had come out here for a convention loved it and it was he just always liked really dry hot weather like to be inside of a, basically an oven and so I uh, we moved here I have a brother and three sisters and he and my mom and all of us came here and I just fell in love with Arizona I see why he loved it so much and and it has been uh, one of the best things that ever happened to me truthfully uh, getting getting away from Louisiana was terrific I'm not a big fan of Louisiana. So. I, I can honestly say I don't think I've ever been to Louisiana. Just You're not that. missing much. I mean, the people there, the one thing about the, the South is people are really wonderfully nice. But the weather there is horrible. And uh, so I was happy to move away. And there's also some opinions there about different people that I'm not real pleased with. So I decided to move here. Melting pot. I'm all in. Well, very cool. I mean, I, I you know, I, I, I lied earlier when we were talking in the green room. I do actually have a few friends in Arizona. The guy that I work with on that infected by our book, he lives in Arizona. So, uh, so yeah, I, I, yeah. At any rate, so, um, but, but you're here, and now we get to talk about you and your, uh, your time in the hobby. And I, and I, how, yeah, when did, when did you buy your first piece of original art? What year? You know, that's always an interesting story because uh, an interesting idea for somebody to think of. I grew up like everybody else did reading comics looking at all this other stuff and then batman the animated series came on warner brothers mm -hmm. and i had always been a huge fan of batman i hadn't collected comics in many many years and the i would come home from school i was in law school at the time and i come home with some buddies and they're like going why are you watching that show i'm going it's so good you guys have to watch it and so they'd sit down with me and begrudgingly watch a cartoon. And then they were so into it. They're like, well, now, so we got a bunch of friends together and we had a Batman watching party after law school every day. And it became this big, wonderful thing. And everybody was so into it. They loved the show. And so then Warner Brothers had their, had their stores at the time and they were selling original cells. Mm -hmm. And then they were selling G Clay's of Alex Ross's artwork and some other people's artwork. And it started my wheels spinning that, there is actually people who are making artwork like this and it's really, really cool. So my very first piece of art, I did a search for Bruce Tim on the internet and I came up with Albert Moy's website and I bought a Bruce Tim sketch and uh, that's what started off the whole thing. Wow. And what, what year would that have been? Do you know? 90, probably 97. Nine, 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 96, 97, 98, somewhere around there, uh, late, late nineties. And, uh, then I, it was so funny because I was so unsophisticated. I asked Albert, I said, well, can I, can I get a certificate of authenticity with this? And, and he was so kind because you know how Albert is. And I've learned over the years how Albert is. He was so kind. He answered my questions and, you know, and, and all this other stuff. And so then I really, started asking a lot of questions and a lot of dealers, Mike Berkey, some of the other guys were so kind with their time and answered my questions and really just got me into the hobby. 
That's interesting. I mean, uh, you know, too kind has never been typically associated with Albert, although he is, yeah. he is a very nice guy. Um, yeah. but that's, that's funny, but you're right. The Warner brothers stores are really big between like 96 to 98, 99 or so. You mentioned Alex Ross. I, I don't have a G play, but I, you know, I've got an X-Men print from, uh, you know, that Dave Cockrum uh, piece that he did. And I bought that, um, probably. And, you know, again, probably 96, 97, prior to buying my first piece of original art, which didn't happen until like 99. So, but the Warner Brothers stores were great, right? For for people who enjoyed comics and, oh, yeah. and the cartoons, because at that point, you know, as my son was just starting to watch cartoons, it was cool to go into a place like that and actually see things that, uh, you know, that applied and, you know, meant something to you. Uh, yeah. That, and, those the arts, and the other thing is, I don't mean to interrupt you, they treated the art seriously. You know, mm -hmm. they had a gallery store. And so I didn't know about, you know, a lot of the art dealers like this and people weren't as, um, you know, they advertised in magazines. I didn't even know that at the time. When you walk into the Warner Brothers store, they had everything displayed really nicely. They had them really well framed, all this other stuff. So they look like genuine pieces of art. And I think that helped elevate my perception, at least, of what everything was. Um, and I think it got it. And plus, they were not cheap, you know, at the time. And so you uh, really kind of had a real appreciation for what they were doing. And it, I think it definitively launched Alex's career into being a much more, not just a comic book artist, but being basically a fine artist and having his pieces be um, well known enough that they were fetching large sums of money, you know, when they go to auction and things like that. Yeah, that's true. I don't remember what I spent on that, uh, that print, but it, it wasn't cheap. You know, it was signed yeah. by Alex and by Dave. And I think yeah. it, at the time it still was probably like three hundred fifty dollars. It was already framed and everything, but still, that was a lot of money to spend on a print. I'd never spent that much on, a, on anything yeah. probably in the hobby before that. And, and to be fair, if you look back to what artwork, even comic art, was like in the '90s, you could buy a really nice cover that today would sell in the multiple tens of thousands for a thousand bucks, six hundred bucks, seven hundred dollars. So comparatively, that wasn't cheap. You know, so, yeah, it, it was an easy kind of step up for me to go from the the G clays and the reproductions and prints to something that there was only one of in existence. And I thought that was really fun. Mm -hmm. And it's so kind of what we talked about before is that I didn't really you didn't put a lot of thought into buying art like you do today, because if that, then I could buy, you know, a few hundred dollars. I could buy a really nice published piece and it wasn't a you know, life altering decision or something that would be the difference between, yeah, that costs a car, you know, or that costs, uh, you know, a few mortgage payments. Now, you know, it was just kind of, you know, a few hundred bucks and you were okay. If I like that picture of Batman, I just buy it. But now you really, as we talked about in the green room, the appreciation for the artistry that goes into the art plays a, a, a much more major role in how I choose pieces now than it did when I first started. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you, like when you first started, you were telling me in the, you know, earlier that, you know, you just if it was a cool looking image of Batman, you bought it. it you know, yeah. it didn't matter if it was published or not. I mean, or, or did it matter? We didn't talk about that. You just if you like the image, you, you bought it. It was just it was just a cool image of Batman. And I love this. I love the cartoon and, and the artistry that went into it wasn't I didn't appreciate really the difference between a published piece and an unpublished piece until I became more sophisticated. And then the you know pricing would go up and things like this but to me it was just a really wonderful piece of art that an art had, an artist had put time and effort into and created something that i could never do myself of a character that i truly love so to me it was very cool mm -hmm. well after your uh, your interaction with mr moy you know where did you yeah. turn to from there did, was it shows or did you was the you, you figured it all out it's on the internet i mean at that point there were several dealers that had websites. I mean, Berkey had I was, still collecting, I was still collecting cells from Warner Brothers. Okay. And I had gotten lucky in that I had gotten to be very friendly with uh, the people at Warner Brothers. And so they had a show and uh, Bruce Tim had come and Kevin Conroy and some of the other people for, from there. And they had mentioned to me that, oh, you know, we've got this whole warehouse full of cells and stuff like this in uh, California we should fly you up to go look through this warehouse and you could just pick some cells and you could just, you know, go your merry way. So I flew up there and I looked through the cells and stuff like this. And um, I was extremely disappointed, to be honest with you. They had, they would paint them and then they would ship them wet. 
And so you would have stacks of cells that were literally just glued, basically glued together. So there was some terrific stuff, but then I was becoming dissatisfied because A, you looked around a warehouse where there's, it's like knowing there's, you know, a million diamonds in the world and they keep the supply very short. Now I'm seeing that there's really hundreds of thousands of cells. And so it was kind of disheartening to me. So I went out and I started trying to find the next thing. And then in 2001 or so, I went to my first Comic-Con uh, in San Diego. And I've never missed one since That's when it's been open. And it just blew my mind because I was walking around. And at that time, there wasn't a big Hollywood presence. You could really talk to the artists. You could really get to know. So I'm walking around and I'm seeing um, artists who are literally creating the comic book stuff as they're sitting there. And so I saw um, Glenn Orbick. I don't know if you remember him. He's since passed away. And he and I spent a little time together and he was painting some pieces and he was just the nicest guy to me. And so I bought a couple of his pieces and some other stuff. And that's what really kind of drew me. And I'm like, mm -hmm. not only am I getting pieces from that are only one of ones that, that I think are very cool, but also the artists are great. And I'm meeting the people behind it who bring so much joy to this hobby. And so I thought that was really, really fun. Well, that's uh, that's one of the best parts of our hobby, right? Is the fact that you actually get to interact with the people who you're buying your artwork from. And, uh, you know, some people will say, you know, you can have bad experiences that way. But by and large, I think most of us have enjoyed our interactions with the artists that uh, we get to pick stuff up from. Oh, I've seen all kinds of people over the years. It's pretty funny. I've represented some of them, too, which is pretty sad. But, yeah, you know, the thing is, is that I have... Um, really found that the guys who appreciate the fans and are who understand you know like i would and i, I tell the story before i had met neil adams several times and i bought some pieces from him and he was somebody who knew where his place was in as an artist and was not shy about telling you and so i thought it was very fascinating since i'm a lawyer i thought it was very fascinating that he had tried to bring um, rights back to the comic book arts and stuff like this. And he was a challenge to talk to, but he was very, but he was very, if you knew how to talk to somebody like that, he was great. And that's kind of one of the things I found with artists is that it's all about the approach. Mm -hmm. It's if you're totally fawning over them and stuff like this, they don't really, some of them love it, but most of them don't. They just want to be talked to like human beings and uh, they have a great talent. And if you're, kind to them they'll be kind back and so it's all about that stuff yeah no neil was uh neil didn't mince words <laughs> when he talked not, to them you know not in the slightest no you knew where, where he stood on anything and uh and he knew what he wanted in, out of any relationship or or you know or anything that he got involved with so that was um you know i i really never talked to him a lot at shows because he always had a crowd, right? I mean, he was, yeah. he'd be at every show I'd, I'd go to. And, and I can't say that I talked to him too often. Even when he exhibited a big wow, when, when I was one of the owners of that, um, you know, I introduced myself to him there, but we, we didn't chat for too long. I mean, he knew who, what comic card fans was, but uh, the two interviews that I did with him before he passed though, yeah, he was, he, he was tough in the green room. <laughs> he was tough throughout the whole interview, but, uh, but I appreciated that, you know, because at that yeah. point in time, you know, he, he, he knew he had everything he needed and uh you know and the cool thing about him was you know he always he was a trendsetter in everything he did you know, he, he was selling on facebook before the pandemic even happened right he was doing live streams and doing and those sorts of things so he was the most prepared creator you know for that event to happen you know and, and he was out there he was he was really the first one doing them like regularly uh every week so yeah i admired him because even at his age, he was still always thinking two or three steps ahead of uh, other creators or, you know, other, you know, marketers like myself or however you want to look at it. Uh, and I don't, I don't know. He, he's uh, he's he's really was one of a kind. I always think of him as the Gene Simmons of comic book artists. He was extremely good at self-promotion and he had no he had no shame about hawking anything that he was doing at the moment. He was extremely good about that. I was at San Diego one time and I'm walking down the aisle and, you know, it's pretty crowded. And he had a bunch of people around him and I glanced over and I caught his eye and he goes, lawyer, come over here. <laughs> and so I came over there and he just started asking me a legal question in front of all these people that were just sitting there about something he had going on. It was, he was a hoot. Oh, that's that's so, awesome. Was, so yeah. had you bought things from him before? I assume, uh, you know, you didn't just give him legal advice. 
No, I, yeah, I had bought some pieces from him. One is in my gallery I have I, that I display in my gallery. It's the uh, recreation of Batman 251. I knew at that time it had the, the, the cover had not been uh, found and nobody knew who had it. Subsequently, it sold at, years after I got that recreation. It sold at Heritage. Uh, the, the original did. But uh, I was very happy to have that because that's, that's one of my favorite covers of all time by one of my favorite artists of all time. So I was extremely happy to, to get that piece. And so he and I chatted about it for a while. So he was very he was very protective of his art and very protective of that piece, frankly. It was funny. What was uh, what was the turnaround time like on a, on a or had he already read, had he done he had it? Already done it. It, had been oh, on his okay. site. it had been on his site for forever. And mm -hmm. I kept coming back to it literally for probably I'm going to guess six years or so. And I finally, uh, we had a mutual friend. I reached out to them. I said, C can you have, can I call Neil? And he said, sure, he'll, I'll set it up. And that's how we got started. And then after that, he would see me at Comic-Con and we talked for a little bit here and there. But mm -hmm. Yeah, he was, a, he was a very interesting guy. Did you tell him you waited six years to buy it? I did. And then I negotiated and he was very upset with me for negotiating with the <laughs> And then he goes, he goes, goes, you negotiate like a lawyer. And I said, well, I, you know, I am a lawyer. He goes, oh, I hate lawyers. And so then it was funny. But he teased me and it was fun. And I took it. And, you know, if you could if you could get past the brashness and the, frankly, abuse that Neil would heap on you, you were fine. And it doesn't bother me. So it was good. I think that was part of it. You know, he was an intimidating figure, even at shows. When he shouldn't, you know, he shouldn't feel that way. But, yeah. you know, um, because his booths, you know, he always had the same booth layout. You know, you you knew Neil's booth when you saw it, but there was just something about his presence that was intimidating. You know, I didn't want to. Well, he was a big guy, and he knew where he was. He was extremely confident, up to the point of arrogance. And so he was, like I said, he knew exactly where he was as a legend in the comic book field, and he deserved he deserved that acclaim. He did so much for comics. He he you know, was such a trendsetter in a lot of things that he did, breaking panels and a lot of the other things that he did artistically that people hadn't done before, in addition to fighting for rights. And that was a big deal for him. Yeah, very true. Hey, Rick Welch wanted to know if he only did one recreation of that cover. He did. And that was another fight that we had because I asked him, I said, hey, look, I'll buy this from you, but I don't want ever want you to do another recreation of it. And he said, I'm not promising you anything. He goes, I haven't planned on doing another recreation, but if I do one, I do one. That was literally what he said to me. And I said, okay. And he, he lucky for me he, that I know of, he never did another. One. But uh, so I got lucky that way. But yes. Wow. That's funny. Yeah. No, you're not going to tell Neil what to do. If he wants to, yeah. if, he, if he wanted to do another one, he would do it. Castro yeah. said uh, he's consoled a few crying artists after a Neil Adams portfolio review. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was brutal. Oh my God. There was only one Neil Adams, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and Gil asked a question that nobody in the chat's answered yet, but I can honestly say that I, I do forget uh, certain pieces in my collection. It's it's happened more than more than once. So, you know, the other day I was like reorganizing some stuff and I found some art I forgot I own. You know, I know. just uh, I I hate that though. I hate the idea that I have artwork that I forget that I've, you know, that it's in my possession. Um it shouldn't be like that you know we 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 store that stuff away sometimes and don't pull it out of the drawer for years it feels like and, and that's unfortunate that's actually one of the reasons why i started posting more and you probably noticed in the last year or so i started posting more george one of my friends who's in the hobby um we, we were talking and he said you've got all this great art how come you don't ever post any of it and i said you know uh, yeah for one thing People will bother me sometimes because I do have some pieces, but I acquired them so many years ago that what they cost me is not what they're probably worth today or what people perceive them as worth. And I didn't buy them because I thought they were expensive or just these fancy covers. I bought them because I truly loved what I was buying and the cost of, or what it would appreciate to doesn't ever, frankly, enter into my thinking unless I just can't afford it. There's George right there. So, there he is. Uh, but uh, so he kind of convinced me to start posting some more stuff and also there were so many great people in the hobby and I was meeting him and Rob Gomez and a bunch of the other guys in the hobby. And they were so fun. Chris Kerr, Ron Silenthal, you know, on and on and on a list of people, Dino, the, the list of people who are so wonderful in our hobby. 
that I'm thinking I've got so much in common with these people and we like so many of the same things. Mm -hmm. It's more important for me to get out there and do these kinds of, because most of the people you meet in daily life, they don't think of artwork the way that we do or the, or the, or the movies or any of the other stuff that we like as seriously as we take it or as fun as we have it. And so it's more enjoyable when I have it with people who I like a lot. And so, you know, I have friends here who do it, Ruslan, Yana, a, uh, a bunch of other people who are here now that like that. And so it's been really, really fun for me. Yeah, that's true. So, so is George though, they kind of nudged you along to push, you know, post some more artwork that uh, you, he did. yeah, he did because he kept saying, what, what do you have this? What do you have this? Send me pictures of that, send me pictures of that. So I'd send him some stuff and he'd be like, dude, you got to put this up there. You gotta put this in. So just, <laughs> okay. So he convinced me. And to your point about forgetting what you have in your collection, you know, it, that's one of the things is that I was going through my collection a little while ago and I thought I've got all these pieces that I know I'm never going to display. I'm keeping them in binders that they are just, you know, for my own particular knowing that I have them like a hoarder and I'm not going to ever do anything with them. So that's why I put some pieces up for sale because I just knew that I, I other people would enjoy them in a way that I wasn't getting enjoyment out of them anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what I'm doing now is I'm trying to find pieces that bring me this wonderful joy and satisfaction, kind of refocus my collection a little bit. And that's why I got that Ghost Rider cover and the Dr. Fate cover recently. Um, I just really love those characters. And so I thought I wanted really great representations of them with comics that I remember that I loved growing up and that mean something to me and not just what we talked about before. That's a really cool image of Batman. I wanted something that now is more important and it's kind of one of the things that we were talking about, which is looking at the artwork differently, changing my perspective on look at the artistry that went into the creation of that versus it's just a cool image. You know, let's look at that combination of penciler and inker and what makes that combination so good or what makes this person's style so interesting or look at that perspective or the detail they put into these pieces, things like that, that really all of us kind of and it's what you were talking about. We would look at a piece and go, I like that piece, but I can't understand why I like it so much. I can't articulate it or think about it. And you have people in the hobby who are so good at that stuff, who just can kind of look at a piece of artwork and look at it like, like Chris does, like we were talking about before. He looks at it from an artist's perspective and he knows how hard that is to do. And when you and he go through a lot of the pieces of art in your um, kind of rundown of stuff, and say, oh, I like this part, or look at that brush stroke, or look at this stuff. It brings a new appreciation and perspective to what I'm looking at that I never had before. And so it's kind of almost reawakened my enjoyment of collecting in a way that's more sophisticated, for lack of a better word. No, well, that's true. We've, uh, like I told you, I've learned a lot too. Chris is fantastic and it's fun. You know, we've ro rotated in a few other people who've done guest selections too, and, and the, everyone that kind of has come in and done it has a is a different view point to a certain degree and that's always good because you know i mean i think we all kind of approach the hobby uh differently but but there's there's moments when i started i did this i was more like you if i just saw a piece of art i liked i just bought it and mm -hmm. uh you know and then i started kind of buying for nostalgia and now i think i buy more as a you know discerning art collector where i'm like you know i'm looking for the the great pencil or inker combos and trying to get representative pieces from the artists that I want to have, you know, in my collection. And um, yeah, but it's taken 22 years to get to this point for me, you know, where I actually feel like I'm savvy enough to, uh, uh, you know, be able to have a discerning eye with, with, with the uh, collections and, 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 you know, the chats that we've done here in the last four years have really helped out in a lot of ways, just talking to other collectors. It's it, until you start networking, you don't really, you know, you don't know the mindset of other collectors, uh, and, you know, and all the things that, you know, drive them as well. You, you, you learn a lot, I think, uh, you know, and, and every uh, collector that you mentioned, you know, five minutes ago, when you talk about Ron Sonnethal or Dino, you know, those are, or Gomez, all those guys have incredible collections, right? Oh, yeah. And the cool thing about CAF is we all get to kind of know what, what's in their collection to an extent. And that's what's, you know, that's, that's so awesome. You know, get, you know, when, when people are willing to share pieces that are just, uh, you know, they may be out of your price range, but it's amazing to get to see those originals, right? I mean, that's that's why I love CAF, and uh, that's why I love, the, you know, the, the hobby by and large because of the people who like to share their stuff and their knowledge and their passion for it. And, uh, 
you know, it's the only reason I'm still here after, uh, you know, all these, all, all the years of doing calf is just because it's so much fun. Everybody's passionate about it. Um, and there's always something new to learn <laughs> too. It's not only that there's something new to learn. There's always somewhere you can go with your collecting. There's always a rabbit trail you can go down, which is always cracking me up. You know, you can say, Oh, I've decided to go find, you know, like me, I, I love Dr. Fate. So I wanted to get a really nice Dr. Fate cover. And now I'm like going, now I want another one, you know, or I wanted to see what more is out there or, you know, he's part of this. And maybe there's some other parts of this justice society that I'm going to look at or all-star squadron or whatever it is. And it leads you to more artists and stuff like this. So it's, it's this really interesting rabbit trail and you start going down that starts you tracking the characters or tracking an artist or whatever it is that spins off from you getting a piece that you were interested in. Mm. And that to me is always fun. Plus it's, it, it, the other thing about our hobby that I think is so cool is that it appeals to so many different kinds of people, people who are just in it for the art. I mean, just in it for the artist's representations and love this, you know, you have, you know, kind of fantasy, these wonderful painted Whalen pieces or uh, things like that, and all the way down to, you know, new types of art, like what Trad Moore is doing with Silver Surfer, this kind of really surreal look to it that has nothing to do with, you know, realism mm -hmm. uh, or the Jack Kirby kind of extended an anatomy and this weird kind of perspective. You start looking at all these different styles and some people hate it. And so people love different things. So there's something for everybody and every price point, young, old, it's such a great hobby for all that stuff. So when you, uh, so you're not satisfied with like one piece from a title artist. I mean, if you, if you get one, sometimes you have the itch to get another one. Is that, uh, is that kind of your approach? It's, or awful. it's awful. It's <laughs> horrible. I hate it. I was just telling a friend of mine the other day, I said, you know, I said, you get these pieces and you never regret the things you didn't buy. I mean, you buy, you regret the things you didn't buy. And that's always what it is. You know, every time I look at Heritage Gallery, I her look at Heritage Auction or other people's galleries, I'm like going, I'd love to have that. That's so nice. I wish I had a bajillion dollars. I'd just buy everything. And then even then there's more stuff coming out. So you can't, A, I really don't want everything. But at the same time, you kind of do. You kind of do. Like you want to, you want to feel like I'd love to collect a whole comic, you mm -hmm. know, and I've got a couple of them that are almost, I've got one that's almost complete. There's another collector on calf that has a couple of the pages from the comic that I need, but uh, that's fine. You know, it, it, it's okay. If I never, if I never finish it, the, the, the thrill of the hunt is almost sometimes more fun than actually getting the actual piece. Cause then when you actually get it, you're like, wow, this is amazing. But it's that hunt that sometimes leads you in a direction you never expected. And you meet people that, you know, you didn't have, you, you wouldn't have met before because like, I'll reach out to a collector and say, Hey, I love this piece. What do you, you know, let's chat about it. And then I won't wind up getting it from them, but they're a nice person. And now I have a new friend. Mm -hmm. So it led in a direction I didn't intend, which is fun. And, you know, George is a great example. He contacted me to buy a piece that I had. I didn't want to sell it to him, but we became friends. And so he's turned me on. He's found pieces for sale that he knows that are in my interest and said, Hey, Jared, this is up for sale. I never would have seen them before. So that was so cool. Yeah. Well, we've talked about the, uh, you know, having good friendships within the hobby is, you know, to your advantage, right? I mean, because yeah. you can look out for them, they can look out for you. And the bigger your uh, your network is within the hobby, the, the better off you tend to be. So, I agree. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's and this that, is a good hobby to be in. And you've been to San Diego a bunch of times. There's never any fights there. There's never any, you know, people, you will sit in a, in a line, and I'm sure you've done this, Bill. People will just sit there and be talking and they'll just talk to you and there'll be something that's interesting that they're talking about that you can get in on the conversation. Mm -hmm. This is such it's a community and it's such a lovely community of people. You know, we all different professions, different uh, walks of life, different areas of the country, sometimes different areas of the world. And we all share this in common, this love of these characters that is so fun that it really is a, a joy truthfully in all those regards. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, and I know somebody asked me what, what uh, I'm looking to collect. Um, and there was a comic that um, uh, uh, Alfred Apatena did with Man Bat and Batman. And it's a really great origin story of Man Bat and the artist. I just love the really dark, gritty kind of style and the way that he inked and drew it. It just really, I just loved it. And so, uh, and it was colored, frankly, I think terribly. 
and uh, the, the black and white images, they should re republish it, frankly, as black and white because it's so incredibly impressive. Uh, and that's the book I'm looking to put together. I bought a bunch. I have most of it, but there's a few pages I'm missing. But you know where a couple of them are. So I know where the cover is and I know where two of the pages are. I'm missing about five of them total in the cover. And I know where the cover is and two of the other pages. I don't know where the other three are, but I have the rest of it. Oh, that's cool. And uh, is it posted to your camp? No, I'll, I'll have to put a few pages of it up because it's so, I just love it. And that's one of the other interesting things about our hobby is that you look at some of the way these pages are colored and it's a very big disservice mm -hmm. to a lot of the way these things have been penciled and inked. They really just, I don't know who colors them sometimes and I don't want to rip on any specific colorist, but um, it really takes away so much from the artistry in a way that I think is detrimental. Sometimes it's beautiful and they do a terrific job of coloring. Uh, but I find that I prefer the black and white images quite often over the colored images. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, we say that a lot on uh, the CAF update when we're, when we're mm -hmm. reviewing stuff because, yeah, uh, it isn't often where a colorist work matches up, you know, and elevates the line work from uh, the uh, the actual piece. It just it doesn't happen that often, um, unfortunately. And it, it, even with a good colors, it probably wouldn't. And, you know, because then you're you know maybe they were good colors and the printing's bad. I mean, we had that in the '70s and '80s where things just didn't print out well. And then in the '90s, everything got garish. And then since 2000, everybody's been trying to do photorealistic colors by and large, and it's you know it it never really works well. <laughs> No, you know, it's funny. And Rick, Rick's exactly, Rick Welch posted it, Batman Legends of Dark Knight, annual number five. That's exactly right. Uh, that That's the book. But um, so thank you, Rick, for mentioning that. But, uh, you, you, oh, he, Marcus Way is asking an argument against color guides. You, you know, um, there are parts of the hobby, and that's another example of there, there's distinct parts of our hobby that just don't interest me in any way, shape, or form. And color guides would be one of them, or these mono prints. I have no desire whatsoever to, to, collect those. I appreciate people who do. I think everybody has a point that it's fun for them. And I think that's fine. As long as you're enjoying and supporting the hobby, that's good. It's just not of any interest whatsoever to me. Yeah. I don't, uh, I don't foresee ever buying a monoprint myself. I mean, it's just, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're gen generally not as expensive as a traditional piece, which, you know, I guess is okay, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I'd let the let the artists go back to working traditionally and and I'll be happy to buy something from them. You know, I see some of the reason why, you know, for example, somebody was posting that I'm lucky to have some Brian Boland. Uh, Dino was, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, Brian Boland is one of those guys that he went digital for a good reason. He understood that he was getting older and he could not draw in the same way he could when he was younger. And so, and he's such a perfectionist. You know, I was talking to... Um, I'm forgetting who it was right all of a sudden. I apologize. But they were telling me how he would blow up like huge an eye so he could draw every part of the iris of the eye in something you could never see when the comic was made because that's how much of a perfectionist he was. And that was suitable for him. And that's why he started really going digitally. He just really he couldn't achieve the same level of. Uh, detail that he did when he was a little bit younger and that that makes sense for me at that point but i think a lot of these guys it's it's sort of the argument with ai art a little bit which is that um i don't want to say it's cheating because that's not fair to the artist but it is in my mind a way of you being able to a piece of art that you could not do traditionally and that's the really kind of one of the only reasons you would go digitally is because you can do a finer line or you can erase any mistakes and do this stuff. And that's to me, not interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot more to it than just that. You know, there's some artists okay. in pencil uh, or ink two or three books a month because they do it digitally. So in their mm -hmm. mind, even though they're losing out on the aftermarket sales of doing traditional work, they're, they're guaranteeing themselves a certain amount of money every month because they can be more productive or, uh, I remember Lee Bermejo at one point when he was switching to uh, to digital, he 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 said something about spending more time with uh, his wife and family and, yeah. you know, and, and more, less time at the drawing table. And th because those are what it, were important to him, you know, so we all get all disappointed because he's not making traditional work anymore. But it was a decision that, you know, worked for him. So, I, you know, I, so I get it. We don't have to like it. Um, I do own two color guides, though, but, you know, they were. I've got, uh, they're both Uncanny X-Men, Bernard, or no, Burn and then Cochran. That's right. One. Uh, so for me, 
I, you know, I, they're actually kind of cool. But would I go out and normally seek, you know, color guides? Nah, not, probably not. Unless it was yeah. something cool. If you get like a complete issue color guide set of something, like maybe a Miller Daredevil book, something that would remind me of, uh, you know, of my youth. I think I might go for something like that if I could afford it. But but you look at what color guides are selling for anymore. You know, the Hakes has sold a couple of complete books from uh, early uh, Uncanny runs, and they're selling for like five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars. So that's already way out of my. <laughs> I'm not going to spend that much on a, on uh, production art. And there's always an exception to every rule. Something could come along that I think is just absolutely amazing, and I would be all in on it. So I I don't want to say it's a hard fast rule, but this just you know at, at some point there is a limit to what you can't you can get too broad in the hobby too and you can't collect everything like we were talking about before so that's just my way i guess of putting some boundaries on myself in some way and leaving some money for my children to be able to yeah. put them to exactly i mean in the and the hobby's changing alberto asked a question about uh, any thoughts on people who draw digitally and then uh print gray lines and then do the inks traditional on top of it. i mean because like, a lot of artists are doing that these days yeah. uh, sean phillips works that way where he sketches everything out on his his ipad and then enlarges them prints them out and then inks that i don't know yeah we'd like to see the pencils at the end of the day but if that's his process and that's what we what we got at least there's inks on it by him um it's a little disconcerting at times but it, but I, you know, we're seeing that more and more and more, especially for guys. My problem is when you can't tell the difference and people aren't being forthright with saying this is a this is something that's just got inks on it and doesn't have actually graphite. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where I'm starting to see. I, I, I and frankly, I think it is a little bit fraudulent to, to come up and say, you know, and, and I, I forgot who was, it may have been on your show where they were talking about the separation between pencils and inks and i have a couple pieces that have uh but paulo rivera did he did it and i actually just sold it the cover to uh with an iron man that his dad inked and i've got the cover to the pencil separately i think that's a better way to do it because mm -hmm. then you've got the original pencils you've got the original inks and you've got them together versus i did a print of my pencils and then i had somebody ink it and that's all there is I right. don't know. I, it, I think it helps keep down what I think is uh, a potential for the kind of with the monoprint thing. I could just keep reprinting my keep making copies of my pencils from now ad infinitum and keep the original pencils. So having that one original is, in, is, is interesting. But as we get into a more technological age, we're just going to have to change the way we buy art. Exactly. Yeah, you just never know. I mean, I'm you know, doing some sales for Brian Hitch and he when he's inking himself these days, he tends to rough something out, uh, you know, digitally and, and print that, but then he blue line, you know, then he's penciling blue pencils on top of the, the pr print rough. So he's at, you know, he's any, he, but he does it cause that's just part of his, his process. Right. And then he inks it. So yeah, we're going it, to, it's just, we're going to have to adjust, you know, over the next 20 years. I mean, it, it's, it, things aren't going to be like, you know, what we've, grown grown accustomed to when we got started and um i don't know i mean it, it, it just is what it is so some of us won't buy it you know and uh and that's okay i love um paulo's pencils and his father joe's inks on separate boards yeah. you know that's the way they're going to work i mean that they're on opposite coasts and that's the easiest way to do it but at least when you buy it you know you're getting both pieces so when, when you really don't like it is when uh, you're buying a uh, blue lined inked piece and you know there's actually traditional pencils out there somewhere else. That's yes. where you'd like to think the uh, the you know, pencil or an inker could at least get together and, you know, make sure that the pencils and ink stay together. And, Wouldn't you, you know, think? It, it's not that complex. I would think there would be something that would work yeah, out. But, so. you know, that's, I, I've been seeing that more and more truthfully. And I know, and, you know, uh, somebody was just posted, Jordan Janelle, just put, some artists are doing di layouts digitally uh, then print out and tighten up the pencils that then have the, and then have that ink. I think if they're taking the piece and kind of loosely doing it and then they go back and refine it with their pencils, I don't have a really as much of a problem with that mm. because, but it's when they just print out a scan of something they've done and that's inked. I don't know. I, I, I probably more have more of a problem with it, but I, I don't, I don't know. It's still the original cover, I guess. So it's the public piece. Yeah, I know, no it's, it's, it, but you know, what is it? I've, I've done a few shows with Dexter Vines, right? The guy yeah. who's an inker and 
at least a third of his stuff these days is from blue lines because he's working mm -hmm. with artists who are not even in the U S so it's, you know, they're just sending the stuff uh, digitally over to him. He's, he prints it out and inks on it. And the, the, then the pieces are never together because the pencils right. are, maybe they're being sold by Kiriskiro because they're in Brazil or something. And so, and Dex has the ink pages. And so it just, uh, yeah, it's, it's. And I know Kevin Nolan does that quite a bit too. And Kevin is such yeah. a phenomenal inker that, uh, he's probably one of my favorite inkers of all time. And whatever he does is just amazing. Every time he inks anything, it's just terrific. Uh, and, you know, I know he does that a lot too. That's true. Yeah. For whatever reason, I know when he works with Brian, they, Brian actually sends him his pencil stuff. Like whatever the mm -hmm. Superman book is that he's been working on uh, that, that Kevin's inking, Brian sends him all the pencils because I guess because they have that kind of relationship. You know, right. they, he wants him to work on it and Kevin wants to work on that. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it'll, it's an interesting place we're headed. But um, but I'm kind of with you. For me, if the original pencils aren't on it, it's a little bit more a harder sell for me, I think. Yeah. I don't want to be too old fogeyish, but that's kind of weird. no, no. I don't want to be either, right? Because uh, you know we're, we're we're trying to encourage new collectors, and the thing is, you know, collectors that are get, just getting started today, that you know, they're seeing 30, 40 percent of the art being produced like that. So you know, they that's what they're they're accustomed to right from the get go. So yeah, it's it's tough. Because but at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with it. The cool thing is, is everybody can collect whatever they want, and you know, I don't fault them for it. Everybody has their own, uh, you know, decision-making process on, on what they're willing to accept with the artwork they buy. And, it, you know, if, if you want to pass up on, uh, so, uh, you know, a particular artist stuff because you don't like the process they use, there's there's a thousand other artists making artwork that probably fit right with it, within the parameters that you see fit to, to uh, add pieces to your collection. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I'm just trying to read through the chat. It's tough. I can't multitask tonight for some reason. But <laughs> uh, let's see. Maki Pupu says there's an article in the Wall Street Journal the other day about how the pencil industry is in decline, but it's the kids that are saving it. That's it. That's interesting. Uh, <laughs> anyway, a canitis. No, Marcus, we're never going there. Um, he. Uh, so so let's talk more about you, Jared. Is there is there any artist that uh, you've been, you know? looking for something from that you just haven't actually gotten a piece uh, added to your collection. I mean, something that's just kind of remained elusive, whether, and maybe it's not an art, maybe it's an artist you already own something by, but you've been yeah. maybe looking for something from a particular title. Yeah. You know, it's funny that you said that uh, probably it, what a lot of people are looking for is the burn X-Men because that's when I, I loved that whole era of X-Men as well. But I think Rob Liefeld owns almost all the pieces for that now so uh and with, with a few really driving up the market unfortunately yeah with a few exceptions so um and he has got an amazing collection so i don't think i'll be getting any of those anytime soon um but uh no not really i mean it, there is um i mean i'm always looking for wonderful pieces so it's kind of hard to say um there is um that's the, i mean it, there's so many good artists out there. I, and one thing I've found is, is that I'm, I think people are stuck sometimes only buying the older artists. And I like a lot of what the new artists are doing. I mean, I, I think Bermijo, who you just said, I don't, I, I mean, I would consider him one of the newer guys and some of the guys from, um, that have really come out from the Philippines and stuff like this, who are just terrific artists. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, I'm looking back at some of the older guys like Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, Rudy Nebris, these older guys who really kind of didn't get as much of their due until recently, who are just terrific artists and the art's been selling kind of low. And I think that they're phenomenal artists. I mean, just really great stuff. Or um, some of the stuff that, um, uh, not Alcatena, but um, Alcala did inking uh, a lot of these artists too. His, you start to really see enough of their stuff that you see how they, how much they, added to what was being done John with John Basima Conan being a particular example when right. Al, when Alcala would ink him it would be lush and beautiful and perfect and wonderful and it, Ernie Chan did a great job too but then when they didn't you could see the roughness and kind of the looseness of John Basima's pencils in a lot of places and they were filling that in for him mm -hmm. and really gave the books this wonderful 
wonderful, amazing character that I just love. So, you know, I'm kind of going back and forth. I'm seeing some of the really new guys who are terrific and just amazing, bringing so much to the hobby. Uh, and frankly, in a hobby that there's so much out there and they're still bringing something new. They're still bringing something interesting and fascinating. So I'm looking at everything, truthfully, still. Uh, well, that's uh, that's good, right? I mean, I, I I too really appreciate a lot of the newer artists, like you said, a lot of the Philippines. I love hanging out with the team from Next Comic Art because they always tend to do something that that impresses me that I wish I got to own, and yeah. uh, you know, and 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 that's always fun. And then I, I, I at the same time I like doing a show with Dan Brereton to see like you know when he's going to do like twenty five new uh, new pieces just to see what he what he's been spending his last two months at, you know, it's, yeah. it's fun, man. It, you know, I have, I have a good time. We have the mystery sketch coming up. I, I've been emailing with a couple artists about doing that. And it's, it, it's always just cool getting to see, you know, people's takes on, on different characters and things. So, um, but I, I, I I'm going to assume at least in the latter part of your uh, collecting years that you've been more of a pu published art collector versus uh, you yeah. know, commission style those sorts of things you kind of I've gotten away from doing any commissions except for a couple here and there and the commissions I'm getting are I'm that I'm trying to get are with um, artists whose work is kind of underrepresented or that I think are just so phenomenal and still have amazing talent I'll give you a great example of Sandy Plunkett mm -hmm. Sandy yeah. Plunkett's artwork is just I mean it's beautiful is the only word that comes to mind it's just wonderful you know uh, it's very dave stevens like in a lot of ways but with its own spin to it it's just a, a joy to see anything he's ever touched paul smith is another guy who i think is um, underrepresented and, and probably not doesn't receive the credit that he's due even though he has credit for some of the stuff he's done just beautiful beautiful stuff and so i would love to get commissions from guys like that that just really aren't publishing anything anymore and still have so much amazing talent to do something with somebody who recently i found that's that's terrific is a guy named rick hoberg and i don't think oh, yeah. a lot of people know him but he did a lot of stuff in fact i just got this double page spread that i put on my uh, calf that he did that was just jaw dropping in fact because i think it's one of the images i sent you when we talk about it later but really a terrific artist who a lot of people probably don't know he's a, he's amazing yeah, that's that is very true. Yeah, Alberto wants to know if you have any Manix art yet. I, I I'm going to assume you probably don't, Jared. I don't, but I was thinking about it for the OAX thing. I almost was going to commission him to get something, and then I, it just didn't happen. But uh, he's a guy that you know his artwork at first wouldn't strike me, and the more I look at it, the more I think it's got this wonderful joy to it that's fun and exciting, and it's just the colors and his compositions are just really, really, really cool. And frankly, Marcus Way got one of the coolest pieces ever with Wolverine holding Cyclops' head. I think that one is just so classic. I, I don't know if I could get something that would top that. So yeah. I, I kind of like <laughs> something. Yeah. I don't know. Well, you know, he did that just to make me, uh, you know, as a, I mean, I wouldn't say it only as a joke to me, but it was to get a good laugh. And and he even got a comp, uh, like a complimentary piece to that just recently from Mannix. But but it's stuff like that. I mean, that's part of the been a part of the joy of the last few years is just the uh, the art that's come out of the fun that we've had in shows, yeah. just the conversations we've had, the, the the thoughts it's it's spurred people to do. I mean, and you're right with Mannix. Uh, I'll be I'll be honest. The first time I saw his stuff, I was I I was really intrigued. I bought. Uh, Jiggy always tells me he he exhibited his work during one of the virtual cons. I think two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. And I got to see it, you know, I, I was tooling around the exhibitor booths before the show started and I saw Mannix's artwork and I was like, damn, that's just totally cool. I've never seen anything like it. So I yeah. bought, I bought a Wolverine piece. And, uh, but the thing is, yeah, he just keeps getting better and better. And I mean, uh, I want a big co color piece. I mean, that OAX yeah. uh, Sentinel piece with Wolverine. I wanted that one really, really badly. I didn't bid on it because I felt like I, I knew going into it, I didn't have more than three grand to spend on it. And I, you know, I knew it would have to go higher than that, but boy, I can tell you, I really wanted that piece because it was. Oh, yeah. And that's, what's fun is that that's what I was saying is, is that that's why I don't want to get stuck in only buying comics with nostalgia because mm -hmm. yes, some of the pieces I have have a tremendous amount of nostalgia for me and I love them. But at the same time, I want to be able to appreciate the new stuff that's coming down like Mannix does and, and some of the other people who are just producing terrific. I just got a piece from Kale New that I'm supposed to be getting today. I'm maybe mispronouncing his last name. 
really cool take on spider I, i'll post it i i got a ghost rider piece and a, and a spider-man piece by him really cool stuff uh, i just think some of these guys maybe it's because they grew up in a different culture and they, they appreciate comics in a different way but their perspective on how they put that artwork on is just awesome mm -hmm. and you know manix is a great example of that because he does stuff that at first glance looks so cartoony and so silly, you're like, you kind of would write it off. And then the more you look at it, the more you realize, no, this is very sophisticated. It's very cool. It has a really underlying sense of humor to it and it's fun. And that creativity and that fun is what art should be. That's what we should love about this hobby. So I think that's great. Exactly. I mean, when you see it, when I first saw it, I thought, you know, this guy must have just gotten started, right? And even yeah. he's been in the business for 20 years. He's, you know, been doing his own comics. He has also looks like a kid, so it makes it it's hard to say. Right. Yeah. Exactly. He literally looks yeah. like he just gotten oh, started. Ugh. Yes, I, I, I completely get it. But but that's what why his art's so good. I mean, he has he's got the foundational chops to be able to put great compositions together. He's got his color theory and his, you know, just a general approach to color is already there. And uh, it's well, you know, it's it's well matured. I mean, he knows what he's doing. So that's there's a reason why people gravitate to his stuff. And uh, yeah, but um, but you know, we should probably start looking at some artwork because I know, uh, okay. you, like Anthony, you break the rules. You, I, I said eighteen. You you brought twenty three. So we have uh, a few extra pieces. You did say eighteen to twenty, and I said you could cut out any ones you want. So I, <laughs> I know you. I never cut sure. anything out though. I can't. I figure if you whittled it down to 23, then we got to go with. Uh, with I'll whip through them, I promise. <laughs> uh, well, we can spend oh, thank you. every piece has a story. I'm, I'm certain of that. And and you started off with, uh, you know, probably a piece. I mean, somebody mentioned in the chat. I think Dino said you've got a great killing joke page. Well, here we're starting off with that. So this is probably my most talk about the thrill of the hunt. Um, I had wanted a Killing Joke page since I very first read the book all those years ago. It's one of my favorite comics of all time. I love so much about it. I know there's a lot of question about it, but to me at the time it was an Elseworlds story and the art, you just didn't see art like this. And it was just so stunning to me um, and the brutality of it in a lot of ways and things like this. I just love the whole idea of could there be something that would happen that would be so bad it would change the course of your life forever just everything about this comic was great to me and so it started a 20-year search for me to track a page down and i had multiple opportunities i shouldn't say i missed multiple opportunities to buy pieces over the years and then i was at a collector's dinner with uh, chris kara and ron solenthal and some other guys in uh, california and i always call them the killing joke club because they all have a page and so we were joking about it and they said, oh, to one of their friends who was there, and I won't tell you who it is, but he said, oh, you, you got to show him, you got to show him. So he pulls out his iPad and on it, he had this page and he said, it's for sale. I said, I'll buy it. It's done. It's, it's a done deal. I didn't negotiate. I didn't make an argument. Whatever it was, I bought it. Uh, it because to me, this was the page, probably one of my, it's probably my, one of my favorite pages of the entire book, other than the, everybody would love to get the ha 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 page with Joker. But um this page has everything it has batman the joker and commissioner gordon it has the three principles of the story and it just is so great and i love the dialogue perhaps you'll kill me perhaps i'll kill you perhaps sooner perhaps later because that's the whole nature of their relationship they're constantly in this eternal battle and uh, so i just this this piece is one of my pride and joys of my collection and and the cost aside uh wasn't why i was pursuing it i just absolutely love this story uh and what a lot of people don't know is this is almost twice up it's it's very large art he draws bigger than 11 by 17. i think it's uh, something like 20 inches by whatever 13 or something maybe 19 by 13 something like that wow so uh yeah. so you can officially say you've joined the club now even though you were hanging out you were you were a fringe member of the club because you didn't have your killing joke page but now you now you have a seat at the table. You know, I don't, I, I was, it was really more of a joke than anything. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> but you know, and, 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 and it's not me being, I, I wasn't trying, I was trying to, I was trying to frankly guilt the guys into selling me one of their pages, truthfully, mm -hmm. but uh, none of it worked. None of it worked. But uh, I was lucky enough and I, and I kept up the hunt. And so it enabled me to become friends with those guys. And so again, that was, that's one of the better joys of the hobby.
So I, I loved it. And I still live in awe and jealousy of all of their collections. So that's good. That's cool. You should have learned a, a secret handshake after you, you know you got that or something. But uh, we but don't have to join joke page, so we don't care anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. You know, I would probably feel the same way. You know, I mean, uh, I, I would, I would, even though I, um, you know, I'm not a DC guy, I would, I'd love to have a page from that book. I mean, who wouldn't? Yeah. It's back to you know when you start thinking about pieces that you you'd like to have for your collection. You know, I would think there's a lot of DC guys who wouldn't mind having a burn on Candy Page, even if they're, you know, not right. really. Just because as an art collector, if you want to get like the, the best, you know, one of the one of the best representational, you know, pieces from a given artist, you know, you're going to want to look for their peak work. Uh, the Absolutely. Best work they're most known for. So. But it was yeah. not only that. He brought, he brought a style to the characters mm -hmm. that even though the kind of the long chin joker had been done, his maniacal looking Joker became basically the status quo for how Joker should look. And the Batman with a little bit longer ears with this massive cape. And, and the other problem I see with a lot of artists is they never give Batman's cape weight. It just looks like it's just this flimsy, even no offense to Alex Ross, but he draws Batman with the weakest cape. You can see through it. I hate that. But Batman's cape is this wonderful, larger than life thing that no superhero ever should really have because mm -hmm. it's just a detriment. But on Batman, it is the thing. And in Brian Boland just nailed it. I mean, he gave these characters everything they needed. It was terrific. Wow. And talk about bad coloring. He went back and recolored it. He, he, he was so unhappy with the coloring that, that had been done in the original publication of Killing Joke. He went back and recolored it. And if you look at the pages, it is you really see how badly colored it was at the time. No offense to the original color, but yes. Yeah, and I've, I've heard him say that before yeah. in, in interviews in the uh well let's see if we're sticking with there's well there's quite a bit of batman artwork here so for those of you in who are marvel leaning you're uh you know you're going to be looking at some good dc art here for a little bit so here's another piece by brian yeah this was from uh jla 200 and again this just supremely i i got this piece again not because of anything other than that hugely dynamic image of Batman. And he does this really cool thing in it that I just think is so crazy. The shadow that's going from Batman's head that covers his symbol to give his, to make his symbol pop out um, was just terrific. And the placement of the hands, I mean, it's a page that is just so dynamic. I can't think of very many pages that are more dynamic than that page. I just absolutely love that page. So it's not even that it's a Bolin page again, it's that it's drawn so beautifully with Batman directly in the center and you know they're spinning around. And unfortunately, the, I need to put, there was a word bubble that's, it has a Green Lantern saying the bat, it's the Batman or something like that. And it's so great. That, that's just a wonderful page in my book. And I love the lines coming around Batman just to give him so much more uh, dynamicism and action, it's just terrific. Yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty amazing, and I, I didn't even notice the shadow <laughs> underneath his chin to do that. But now that you look at it, you know, again, those are the things that you know, like Chris and I talk about a lot. You know, that's something that you've noticed that you appreciate about it, and then you see that, and you're like, yeah, dang, Brian's pretty smart. You know, he knew what he was <laughs> doing there to kind of accentuate the right points and uh, just make this thing so dang dy dynamic. I mean, the cape, while it has a lot of weight, you know, it's 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 drawn in a way that you know the the you, the movement comes through in it with those action lines cutting into the cape like that it's it's really exactly technically smart yeah i mean and the cape doesn't even make sense i mean it, it really it's, it's drawn in a way that it sort of doesn't make sense but it really is so powerful and it's just to me this is kind of everything batman is he's surprising black canary and green lantern and going over the, you know this is why batman's the best yeah that uh that's what they say wolverine i always thought was the best but i don't know <laughs> Yeah, I think Batman could take him, but we'll see. All right. Well, I think Batman could take Superman, so there you go, and that's probably <laughs> That's true. That's completely bullshit, too, so I know it. Alberto would be telling us Cap could take them all, but... Uh... <laughs> right. <laughs> that's right. I think that's funny. Uh, but we're sticking with the with Batman here for this one as well. And, and again, uh... this isn't just because it's a Batman page. It's because it's a George Perez page. Mm -hmm. this, this is one of those pages that I bought for all the reasons that we talked about before, the artistry in it is just gorgeous. There is not a speck of whiteout in this. 
I talked to George many years before he passed away about this particular cover. And he loved that he did this cover. And one of the things that I always loved about it is that they magnify Batman through the scope and he kept it all in perspective with the rest of the house in the background. So he zoomed in in his art and just, I mean, just everything about this piece was what made George phenomenal. There is just nobody who drew like this. So yeah, you, so you actually spoke to George about the uh, the piece at a, at a show or oh, something? Oh yeah, I've had this, I've had this for, uh, most of these pieces like this I've had for, not the killing joke, but uh, this page I've had probably for 20 years or so. I just, when I saw this, I was, this blew me. I don't even remember who I bought it from, to be honest with you. But whoever I did, thank you. Uh, this page just blew me out of the water. This is where I could immediately see the artistic value of this piece in a way I didn't even see in the Bolin pieces because I knew how long it must have taken him just to do the sky and the bricks and the detail in the house and all this other stuff. I mean, it was just, to me, it was just an amazing feat of, uh, of drawing because I don't know if I could think how to draw with magnifying the middle image and keeping everything else in the same perspective. And even the even the shadow behind uh, Batman on the left-hand side is drawn in perspective. And it's even, and it's not even visible in the image. So I mean, it's just crazy how he did this. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, so many things that George did was, uh, you know, he just, he defied the logic, you know, there's, there's no, no, it's no wonder why he had, all, you know, the hand problems he had, uh, you know, later yeah. in his career, because I mean, he, you know, his focus on the detail and stuff was just impeccable. I mean, he, he had a vision and he was not going to do anything less than that. And yeah, you see a piece like this and it's just like, yeah, that's why George was uh, just an amazing talent. I mean, he, well, I mean, even look at the lean of the house. So the house is, your perspective is the house is leaning to the right, but you don't think about that. You don't think the house is looking like it's going to fall down because he's got the bat signal up in the upper right-hand corner. And so it kind of balances out the piece in, in a way that your eye is really still drawn directly to Batman. So you don't catch some of the other stuff that gives the piece this really cool perspective and, and, and presence to it. Exactly. I mean, and there's story in here as well. It's not it's not a character driven piece. It's just beautiful. And I'm sure when you saw it, I mean, it was just it, you you know, I get it. I get it. I mean, being overwhelmed by a piece being so darn, uh, darn amazing that you have to buy it. And it's yeah. cool. That you, it's cool that you've owned it so long. You don't even remember who you got it from. <laughs> I don't. I, I know that sounds sad because it's one of my favorite pieces and I literally have no idea where I got it from. Probably from probably from one of the dealers, I'm sure. But I just don't remember. Who. Yeah uh so it, say well just gonna go switch right over into some marvel artwork here and oh. we gotta we, we're, we're appeasing those who are uh, fans of spider-man uh, and that's my problem is i like both and so i'm stuck buying dc and marvel because i like both so much so now that that's the problem. batman's my favorite but you know the truth is is that i will totally agree that marvel had the better storylines but uh, in some ways dc had the better characters so it, it, it kind of balances out sometimes but um it was really, really great. And to see, to get a really good example, I thought Todd McFarlane was somebody who brought so much to this character in particular. He, he put his, definitively put a stamp on Spider-Man, but he was also doing things that were so cool visually. And this piece represented a lot of that for me, splitting the panels using the webbing. And um, I, I bought this piece because I loved the, different incarnations of spider-man you know he's swinging he's showing the bat light which i always thought was funny on his belt which is a spider i always thought that was kind of funny putting the light down like a bat signal and then intimidating the people to do these things i just and and spider-man swinging in this crazy you know dislocating his hips kind of way it was just so cool so th th that was one of the and, and obviously the detail and the time it took just to put all the black in was and, and to make sure you know it was all done so meticulously it's it's a terrific example of todd's work i think oh yeah without question i mean it, the way it's uh the panels laid out because of the the webbing just mm -hmm. so smart. and the the layout's fantastic the the building and silhouette from the upper right hand corner you know all these things right. help block the page really well and, right. and just, yeah yeah no i'm i i i always like this page so this is uh 
Yeah, it's very, very, very nice. And and look, even Rich Danny's mentioned just today, uh, McFarland was announced. He's going to be at a con. He doesn't do that too often. So if you're in Canada, going to the Calgary Fan Expo, you can actually uh, probably pay an exorbitant amount of money to to get something <laughs> signed by the Todd Father. But it probably yeah. it probably would be worth it <laughs> to do he it. He lived here. He li actually lives in Arizona, and uh, uh, he's he's another guy that I think would, it would put into the uh, Neil Adams category of artists. Uh, he he's uh, Sometimes not the most pleasant guy, but uh, definitely a super talent. Uh, definitely never begrudge him any of that. You ever run into him? I have never spoken to him, but I have represented people who worked for him. And it was not a pleasant experience. And I, and I know enough of them that it's true. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it, he, he's, a, he's a very difficult guy. Well, I mean, uh, most incredibly successful people who have big egos generally are right and he he earned it in his in his own way i mean he's working his tail off i mean i i don't know i haven't i have not experienced that level of success so i don't know what it would do to me if i well if I, I think you'll get you're getting there now you have an oax <laughs> i don't That's know about you're that. You're playing. pretty soon it's gonna be called bill cox's oax uh okay. yeah i don't know <laughs> guess was in the audience but no it's uh it's always a team project, you know, OAX. I, I, I always look at that, honest to God. I really always, I, I look at everything that I've done. It's like if the community wasn't a part of it, they didn't buy into it as much as I bought into it. None of these things would be successful. So, you know, you can look at it and say, you know, that uh, the ideas and concepts might start in a certain place, but it doesn't work if everybody doesn't want to do it. You know, it's, it's you can make the best comic book and if nobody buys it, it's, it's you know, it didn't exist. So, I, I think there's there's something for that. I, I, you're extremely humble, but the truth is, and I bet everybody in the chat would agree with me, and this is not me blowing smoke, we wouldn't be here without you. You've built a community and you built a place for, you know, it's, it's kind of the field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. You didn't just build it. You encouraged it. You put things in place for us. You've started the YouTube channels. You've done all these things to improve the hobby along the way. And I told you this, you, you've made my appreciation of my own artwork and of other people's artwork so much better and given me a perspective on it that I didn't have before. And it and it's truly a joy. And I think that you deserve a lot of the praise for this. And I'm not saying that just because I'm on your show, because I don't have to kiss your ass because I'm doing this for free. But uh, <laughs> next time you can pay me or you can pay me right. after that. You know? But the truth you is, is that you, you're doing all the right things. Now you've got OEX, you're, you're taking your business model and your uh, community and helping it grow and presenting it in a way that is appealing to more and more people and can bring, and it's inclusive, not exclusive. And that's a huge, huge thing that I think is lovely. I mean, even just the dueling dealer stuff where you're funny and do those kinds of things, it makes it fun for everybody. Well, that's, I want to have fun. That's, you know, that's part of it. But, but honestly, growing the hobby is a big key component of the stuff, you know, anything that Casper and I are kind of working through these days, it's always thinking about that. How do we, how do we find ways to, uh, you know, get more people interested in the arts, right? I mean, it's, because uh, it's not an easy thing. You know, yeah. the arts is not something that, you know, there's a reason why, you know, you have the term starving artist, but it's just at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a, it's a part of our culture that not a lot of people gravitate to as far as art collecting or even wanting to be a, a creative, right? So it's, uh, you got a lot of things working against you. But, you know, the cool thing is, is that most people who collect are creative. I mean, you know, I have an arts background. And so I think, you know, you, you kind of put those people together. Casper's got an art background. I think, you know, putting up, you know, trying to put it all in a, in a pot, shake it up and then come up with, you know, find the best ideas. I think I think we'll find a way to slowly, uh, you know, grow the hobby a little bit. But um, uh, let's see. John Clancy says over 50 percent of his published art in his collection was due to calf gallery owners posting them. All right. Mm -hmm. That's always good to hear. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, the truth is, is that 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 that's extremely true. I have made money and lost much, much, much more money by being a member of CAF because I have bought so many things from people on CAF or that you have encouraged me to do uh, stuff like this. So yes, you are responsible for. I should send you a bill, essentially. <laughs> Please don't. I might not yeah. be able to pay that for. I might need to yeah. take time payments to cover that. Well, um, I think it's a lot of the credit is, is frankly due to you because you brought so much joy to all of us too. I mean, even just being here in the, in the chat and having that presented where we can all gather for a few minutes and listen to me bore people with how stupid my artwork is and they're being nice enough to listen to me. It's because of you. So they'll either punish you for this or they'll congratulate you for it. <laughs> and you know, before I forget, uh, uh, Michael Whalen, 
Why you got a thing for some Michael Whalen art that you uh, haven't been able to? Uh, you know, we, we talked about earlier yeah. some art, artworks that you wish you could have. And we, that's, that's, that, that's not a name yeah. most people are familiar with, I think. But uh, so, I, and I agree with you. So Michael Whalen is probably one of the most award-winning, maybe the most award-winning fantasy artists of all time. It's fantasy and science fiction. Most of the covers that came out in the seventies, eighties, nineties. At some point, somebody has seen one of his covers. He did all the Isaac Asimov Foundation trilogy. But the most important thing to me was he did the original Daw publication of Elric of Melnibone books. And I'm a huge, uh, even even as much of a nerd as you may have thought I was, I'm going to go deeper. I love reading. I've read my entire life. And um, when I was younger, I played Dungeons and Dragons. And so it shaped how I thought about life and how I had a moral code and problem solved and be a member of part of a group. And now people, my kids play Dungeons and Dragons and it's lovely and especially uh, to see girls in the hobby and things like this, which didn't happen before. Um, and this exercise of the imagination truly was my escape in a lot of ways. And it formed who I am and made me a better lawyer, made me a better father, made me a better husband. So I really credit a lot of this with that. And those books, when I was growing up, Elric of Melnibone, I, um, the stories were just amazing to me. I just could not read. I mean, there's lots of other characters, Conan and, and a million other fantasy books I've read over the years that are tremendous, but Elric stayed with me and those covers is what pulled you in. It's the same thing with the comic book. A great cover of a comic book, and like George Perez cover is a good example. That When you see that cover, you want to know what's going inside the book. And that's what a great cover is supposed to do. And what Michael Whalen did is he would show you these images that of things you could never conceive of. And he did, was equally gifted in being able to conceive of things from science fiction and fantasy. And he did a cover called Stormbringer for yeah. Elric and Monobone, which I'm sure a lot of people know. It's a very famous image. And that cover to me is my grail. There's no other pieces in my collection that are my grail. That is my grail. And I have been in contact with them for many, many years. They do not want to sell that piece. They still own it. Well, so I have tried. <laughs> Lots of other people have tried, but uh, they will not sell me that piece. But I am, uh, it's not a big secret, I guess now, I will be adding a Whalen dragon piece to my collection here somewhat soon. Well, that'll be cool. That's, uh, mm -hmm. I played D&D. Both of my daughters, who are 19 and 21, play D&D now. And uh, I think it's, I, and they didn't get it from me. You know, I didn't talk, I really never talked a lot about it. I didn't hand them yeah. the monster manuals. They had other friends that got interested in it. And, uh Gwen, she she's usually the DM, you know, so it's uh it's it's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean it's uh it's it's it is it is cool, you know. I mean to, to have uh to have that game still have relevance. And it's funny when you, you talk about moral code and all that kind of stuff. I mean that's that's so much part of that game game and uh and you're right in a weird way I you know I never thought of it like that before but D, &D might have kind of helped give me a you know the, the right nudge to go in the right direction as far as uh just you know being a better person, you know, just from playing that game. So absolutely, well, I mean, you know, it did. It also taught me how to work with a group. You know, funny enough, because we'd have to all, and we all had our own skill set. And so the things that it taught you, not just the difference between right and wrong, and going out and wanting to do good for, at least in my case, I know friends who want to go out and do evil, but you know, it, it, it certainly was good for me. And then comic books taught me, you know, I wanted to work out because I wanted to look like the characters who I was admiring so much. And, you know, and so that started me on a health journey that's maintained my entire life. Mm -hmm. And uh, so all of these factors have come in, I think, in a lot of positive ways to shape who I am, certainly. And also it taught you a fundamental kindness that uh, was necessary for, I think, people to exist in a world, in a community today. And that's what I try to instill in my kids. And so I think it's fun and, you know, narrative storytelling and all those things that I use in my practice to be a good lawyer because I have to put a facts, I have to put a story together to present to a judge or a jury or whatever it happens to be. And, uh, you know, all of those things were extremely helpful to me mm -hmm. and I love it. And so I, I, I don't regret being growing up as like I did, although in the 90s, you had to stop for a little bit, maybe the 80s so I could date girls. So other than that, <laughs> I don't know if I had to stop. Well, at least you took a break for that. Uh, yeah. Not a paladin, I'm probably more chaotic good. So there you go. <laughs> Sorry, Ian. Um, all right, well, let's keep looking at some artwork here. At least we got the the, the Michael Whalen plug out there. So yes, 
That's so uh, if anybody has the Elrica Mel Nabone covers, let me know. I know Albert has a prelim to a sailor on the seas of fate, but that's fine. You can keep it. All uh, right. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. My gosh, that's so amazing. This is, this is another example of just me loving Batman the animated series. And, and so uh, Bruce had done this piece. It was a centerfold to um, a comic uh, animation, uh, pardon me, a, a, a cartoon animation magazine that had a very short life. And um, this cover just struck me. The reds, the, 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 the blues, and obviously Batman's eyes just coming out. And obviously the Phantasm. So to me, Batman Mask of the Phantasm is the finest theatrical interpretation of Batman ever done. That's who my Batman is. It will always be my Batman. I just think it's perfect in every way. And so I was pleased to get this piece. Well, and it's a tie back to the to the cartoon, which she said, you know, really got you in the yeah. collecting mindset too. And it's the only it's the only painting. I've ever seen Bruce do, I, and I have been a fan of his like, for 30 years. This is the only one I've ever seen. And, and I've talked to Albert about it because Albert represents him. And Albert said there's one other one that he did a, a similar one to this that Albert says he owns, but uh, I've never seen him do anything else like this. And so, and this is normally, uh, um, he only draws an eight and a half by 11 with colored marker on kind of thinner paper. And this is actually on canvas. And it's a true painting. It's not colored pencils or markers. And so it's a really, really testament to if he really wanted to, he could he could do some stuff with uh, paints and he just doesn't. It's terrific. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's spectacular. You When you see this, it makes you wish he would paint on canvas. Exactly. I totally agree. And that's why I was so happy to get this. It was uh, it was kind of an accident that I got it, to be honest with you. I remember I was buying it off of eBay and I had to leave. And so I put in a bid and I put an extra zero in my bid and I didn't know it until after I won. <laughs> <laughs> and if I, if, if somebody had been really bidding it up, I would have been in deep, deep, deep trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, I you paid much more than you expected, but, uh, but that's- No, I didn't. That was the funny thing is, is that I didn't pay more than I expected, thank God. But I had, I put in an extra Z. I was in a very big hurry and I had to run out the door. I'll never forget as long as I live. And I had to run out. I was trying to wait, 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 and I couldn't do it. So I finally put in my bid and I, and I bid and I ran out the door and I came back and I saw what I had actually bid. And it was, it was much, much, much higher than I was, uh, than I than I thought I had put in. But no, I got it for a fair price, so that was good. Sweet, no, it is beautiful, and, and the red is really what 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 makes this. I mean, the way he's oh, yeah. uh, he's yeah, painting yeah, yeah. Batman here, just leaving so much to the imagination. You know, I love the fact that it's only eyes and we don't see his face. Uh, that's right. That's that's what makes this thing so special. Otherwise, Batman. it's just another Batman image. This is uh, yeah, it's gorgeous. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'm really pleased with that one. All right, so Marvel fans can rejoice once again. So we have some uh, Doc Strange here and uh, Clea. It's just a, this is just an amazing, amazing piece. So you can tell me that you've owned this one for 20 years too? No, I haven't owned this one for 20 years. I've owned this one for probably almost right about 10, maybe. Okay. Uh, yeah, and it was so funny because I had one year where three or four pieces, including The Killing Joke, um, popped up that I had been looking for. And so that was just an extremely expensive year for me. But um, this piece popped up in one of the auctions and I love Frank Bruner's um, Doctor Strange. He's been, he's the guy I just imagine when I think of Doctor Strange, it's kind of like those of us who grew up and thinking Christopher Reeve is our Superman or Kurt Swan is our Superman. Uh, this was my Doctor Strange and I've always really liked the magical uh, characters in both DC and Marvel. And uh, this was everything I wanted in a piece, just literally everything with Frank Bruner's style and its perfection. And the truth is, is when I saw it, I immediately thought of Vincent Price's face as Dr. Strange's face. And it's so clicked and so made sense. I thought, oh my God, this is perfect. And so it's just, to me, this is great. And it, this is also a very large piece. It's more than a double page spread. Uh, it was a centerfold uh, for the comic at the time. And it, it's really with the old one behind him and Clea, like you said, it's just got all the elements of a 
phenomenal Doctor Strange piece. And I love the power coming off his hands and kind of forming the background around um, uh, the old one's face. And then the other thing he did that I thought was very clever is putting the moons in the corners and having Doctor Strange's cape break that panel. And so when I framed it, I have the matting going around Doctor Strange's cape. So it kind of breaks that as well. Well, I mean, it has a Art Nouveau feel to it, but I mean, I love it. Bruner's, he's amazing. He was fantastic. He was so well suited for uh, yes. Doctor Strange, right? I mean, whenever I think of Doctor Strange, I think of Bruner first, and then maybe a little Steve Ditko after that. But I, but Bruner's the one that I grew up on too. So when I, I just, I love this piece. I, and and the his his market's finally, I think, getting getting where it's due, right? Where you're actually because yeah. there's those Doctor Strange covers that have come on the market in the last four or five years or less, you know, are finally hitting prices that I think, you know, the, the deserved, you know, of uh, visibility. And um, yeah, this is, this is beautiful. I mean, as a, as a pinup piece that was published, uh, yeah. you're not going to get anything better than this, this, this artwork. And that's what I thought. And I haven't, I'll be honest with you, you were talking about, kind of, this is kind of me one and done. I, I, I didn't care about it. I, not that I didn't care. I'd love to have one of the other Frank Bruner's covers and some of the, maybe the other stuff, but this to me is so great that I just don't feel a need to go after anything else of his with the Dr. Strange. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we, one of the things that we didn't talk about is how sometimes you find the perfect artist for the, per, for that character. And they can take a character that, um, you know, like John Totalbaum, frankly, on, on, on man, uh, Swamp Thing or, or, or yeah. and, you know, the, the, it's just a perfect marriage of artist who has a vision for a character and makes that character something you didn't, even the St Stephen Ditko, um, Dr. Strange didn't have this mystique and this attitude and everything else that went behind what Frank Bruner did with this character. He infused his character with so many attributes just in his artwork that were so perfect that sometimes you just get that, just like Todd McFarlane with Spider-Man. I mean, just the perfect marriage of artist and character, and they know what they want to do with that character in a way that no one's done before. And it gives the character this gravitas that, you know, is just so perfect. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. I wouldn't want another piece if I had this one too. <laughs> you can't get it, you just can't top it. Um, and I agree, I mean, I look at those, uh, those, those Doc Strange covers, they're all great. This image is better than, any of them so um yeah i, I well, thank you i have to agree so thank you oh man yeah uh so let's see what is the oh i know what the next piece is <laughs> this is this is uh, uh you know i mean come on this is from this is avengers 118 bob brown i mean bob brown doesn't get a lot of credit but boy he you know he he was he he was very prolific during you know his his time out there and frank frank giacoy inks on this title page this is just phenomenal it's amazing. And, and this is one of those pages where I didn't buy it because the art is phenomenal. Bob Brown was fine. Yeah. Uh, I bought this piece because I just, to the death. I mean, come on. It's so awesome. <laughs> now the characters are like, I'm going to kick your ass. I mean, this is just them ready to just, you just, I love this piece in every way because it's such a cool image of all these characters. Like bring it on. We're coming out. You just don't, I've never seen a page like this before. So I just, I've always really, really liked it said uh, I had missed it. Somebody had bought it. And then the guy who bought it uh, offered it to me. And I was very lucky to, to pick that up. Um, you know, I thought it took me a little bit to figure out, frankly, like I couldn't figure out for a minute that that was Silver Surfer. I, I Then I finally figured it out because it's just not how you traditionally see him. But uh, this is great. And, you know, like I said, I like I like uh, Bob Brown a lot. I thought some of the perspective on the character, I mean, some of the sizing on the characters might have been a little bit off. So I thought, you know, like Thor's hammer is a little big and Hulk is a little small, but he fit them all in. He did it great. Yeah. Yeah. That was my only first thought, too. Hulk's a little small. <laughs> but yes. hey, at the end of the day, what do you got? Like 17 characters or how many are on there? I mean, it's still a great title page. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is one, this is what a title page should be. It, mm -hmm. It's just perfect in every way. It, this is what I want to see. It could have been the cover. It could have been anything. It's just so great. Agreed. Well, you are uh, quite fortunate to have this oh, one yeah. in That's your, and, and it's kind of neat. I, you know, I didn't notice it before, but uh, in the, you know, has Engelhart, you know, as the writer, they skip pencil, they go right to the anchors, Esposito and Giacoya. 
And then they have mm -hmm. that heartfelt thanks to um, blown away Bob Brown. You know, that, that's this yeah. an, it's a very interesting way to to handle the credits for our title page. You know, I mean, that's. Uh, I thought that was, you know, I've always wanted to kind of find out the story behind it. I, I know a little bit. I heard that he was brought in at the very last minute because whoever was penciling it before either couldn't get it done or something was happening. I can't remember the whole story, but, um, and so he came in at the last minute. I mean, he even made Iron Man's face grumpy. So if you can do that, that's pretty good. <laughs> I, I did notice that off, you know, right away. I thought that was good, but uh, yes. that's cool. Yeah. Well, again, that's, that's the, it was touches like that that made Marvel more appealing all the time for me. So it felt like, you know, that these guys were taking care of each other, you know, and, Absolutely. You know, and you read yeah. that. And, yep. Very much like siblings, they would fight with each other and then they'd make up and they stand beside each other and, you know, all that stuff. And I'd always love the interplay between Thor and Captain America and Iron Man, you know, the, and Hawkeye even, you know, all those characters were just so terrific. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're uh, switching back over to DC here just a little bit. This is uh, a, uh, this was, what was it from? I know it's Burn and Napero, right? But right. I think this is an awesome I, you know, I love Robin slipping in behind him to trip him up and yeah, just great combinations. I think, you know, when Burn, Burn was, you know, I mean, he's just amazing talent, uh, you know, whether it's, whether it was writing or he was drawing books, but I feel like, you know, nobody had the, the, well, there were other creators that had this, but he, he had the ability to be able to work with anybody that he wanted to. Right. I mean, and he got and draw everybody. everybody. He could draw everybody. Great. Exactly. I mean, every, everything he touched was great. Mm -hmm. and, and even though they had some of the same similar facial features, they all were distinct personalities in the way they moved, in the way that he drew their anatomy, just everything. I mean, Byrne is a true, another one who's a true talent, but his talent isn't so focused on one specific character or even group of characters, even though he's mostly known for X-Men. He could do everybody. He did Superman. He did Batman, Spider-Man, X-Men. He was one of those extremely, I mean, to me, he's a giant and probably one of my favorites of all time because he could storytell too. He wasn't just limited to the artistry, which a lot of guys are, or storytelling. He could do both very, very, very well. Oh yeah, F, you know, Fantastic Four, Alpha Flight, She Hulk, Super. Yeah, uh, yeah. And the thing is, he, you know, he once we moved, he got to work with Giordano over, right. you know, on Superman. I mean, so I think, you know, he was big enough. He could call his own shots. He could play. He could work with whomever he wanted to in any character with any characters that he wanted to. And he got to work with every single major character from uh, and Marvel and DC. And it, but his runs, he, he wasn't just working on the characters. His runs on those characters are like the definitive milestone runs mm -hmm. on a lot of the characters that we all remember as some of the best of their uh, time ever in comics. And you're talking about characters who are now 80, you know, it's almost eight, well, but yeah, 80 years old or so. I mean, the, his, his runs are remembered as some of the best. It's crazy. Yeah. But, uh, this is, this is a, it's a classic image. It's, it's amazing. So uh, I like this one. I was lucky to get this one. I absolutely adored this image. And this is, this is a nostalgia piece for me as well as it being a, uh, um, uh, just a greatly wonderful laid out piece of artwork because of uh, I bought this with my brother and we looked at this page over and over and over again and you know trying to figure out who some of these characters were because we had we didn't know who they were uh, and so we would make up stories with them and stuff like this so this page is a terrific page for me well this uh, this next piece is from my second favorite uh, journey to mystery with Thor book this is uh, from 115 when he was fighting the absorbing man so the yeah. Magneto issue is my number one. It was a 109, I think. But, yeah. but this is my number two. I, I love, uh, you know, Kirby during this period and uh, uh, on Thor. I, I could go back and reread the first, you know, the, the, the first 25 to 40, 40 books from Journey into Mystery, you know, and I, I love them as much today as I did when I was a kid. But The Absorbing Man was just such a cool Cool. It was a great story, and the art was amazing in it. You got a great page here. Absorbing man, it's funny because remember I was telling you there were a few paces came up in the same year or mm -hmm. so that I was looking for. This is this is one. The uh, Killing Joke is another. The Doctor Strange is another, and then one of my uh, Dick Sprang Secrets of the Batcave piece. All four of those pieces came up in the same year, and uh, I was just like dying because I had wanted all of them for forever. And this piece, Absorbing Man, is one of my favorite villains because I just love the nature of his power. 
And uh, you have to think that the guys at Marvel must have been sitting there going, this is going to be so cool. We're going to have his ball hit the hammer. And it's, you know, just the thinking of the, how they were thinking how cool this piece was going to be and how much you know that Jack Kirby was getting joy out of drawing this because it's such a cool image. I just loved it. I just thought this was perfect. This is everything I wanted with Thor fighting. I think what I think is his most interesting, other than Loki, his most interesting villain. Um, and it's just a terrific, terrific piece. The one thing I've never seen him do is shoot fire out of his hammer, though. Because this is one of the only times I think I've ever seen that. I think it probably is. I was thinking that same thing when I was looking at this, but uh, that's okay. It's the first and last appearance of fire coming out of uh, Thor's hammer. That's um, true. But no, I mean, I love, uh, yeah, the, this this issue is just so memorable. And you're right, Absorbing Man is a great villain. I mean, he's fought everybody. He fought She-Hulk. He, you know, he, he fought Dazzler, for crying out loud. I mean, he's yeah. he fought every, you know, uh, yeah, one of, the, one of the best Marvel villains of all time right here. And this, this mirrors the cover. This was, uh, on the cover, he's he's got the hammer hitting the ball as well. But frankly, I think this image is better. Uh, than what they put on the cover. But uh, yeah, it's just terrific. And it's one of the few times where Kirby actually drew uh, either somebody, I don't know if that's a Kirby face or not for Thor in the last panel, but certainly I thought that was what made it kind of cool. Kirby didn't really like to draw a lot of faces like that. It's funny, he just had this thing. But I thought this was such a great piece. Agreed. Yeah, well, sometimes it happens like that where you are saying earlier that uh, it's a, it's a embarrassment of opportunities happen for you you know the killing joke page that one uh but but you weren't going to miss those opportunities like you said earlier no. it's the it's the purchases you don't make they're the ones that you regret so when these things come along sometimes you gotta you gotta stretch yourself out a little bit just, to, just i did yeah and this is this is another example and of, of two things one is is that it's so funny i i had been admiring this piece in the collector's calf for forever because I'm a huge fan of, I love Conan. I just absolutely am a huge Conan fan. And I also like Mark Schultz a lot. And I've been really looking for a great piece of Mark's and I just couldn't find the one that I wanted. And um, I was on his gallery and I clicked to refresh my page um, and it came up for sale. And I immediately contacted him and bought it. And funny enough, he lives near me. And so we became friends. And so we've been uh, uh, having lunches together and stuff like this over this piece. So I got a friend and I got an amazing piece of artwork. But Mark Schultz is, a, is another talent that is just terrific. I mean, just everything about this piece. The girl's face is, and Conan's, you know, no problem whatsoever running across the edge. And I love the cat because it's showing you the agility that Conan's supposed to have, even though he's so big and muscular. Something like this, you could just run along the ledge like a cat and still carry the girl at the same time. Pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, no, I agree. This is a, this, this is a keeper. <laughs> you know, I'd yeah. never let this one go if I got it because uh, Schultz yeah. is amazing. And yeah, this, this is just, the way he handles the, the, you know, he's the sinewy muscle on, on Conan with the brushwork. And then he draws the, the soft, supple woman that he's carrying in his arm. I mean, everything about it is just so smart. And, you know, just piling these buildings on top of one another gives you a sense of unease. I mean, that, and he's running on, the, on a ledge. I mean, it's just, uh, yeah, this is just an amazing image. So I love, I, I love it. And even the fingers on her waist, he didn't have to draw the fingers there. He could have just had, you know, them covered by cloth or whatever. But no, he put every thought and detail into this. Even the even the shadows from the lattice of the window being propped up there and all that. I mean, just the different in textures between the wall and inside. It's just terrific. It's just an amazing piece. Yeah. Congrats on that one, man. Now, you just mentioned this piece as newly yeah. added to your calf as well. Yes, I'm very, very, very happy about this piece. I love Dr. Fate, and I've been trying to find a great Dr. Fate cover or page for forever, and they just do not exist. There's so few really good Dr. Fate pieces out there. And when I saw this, I'm like, I just, I just had to have it. So I was lucky enough to make a deal with a really nice collector and uh, dealer, and he very, very kind and worked with me to get this piece, and I love it. And it's got all the major villains. Dr. Faze has always been one of those really, really cool characters that, you know, and he kind of, a lot of the characters are the same, which is Ghost Rider, Hulk, some of the, even Batman, where there's kind of two distinct personalities and they're almost a Jekyll and Hyde kind of thing going on where Dr. Fate is 
you know, Kit Nelson, and then he puts the helmet on, and now he's Nabu essentially, and it takes over his body and controls him like Ghost Rider, or Hulk, some of the other ones. But uh, it's just a really, really interesting, cool cover, and it's by a very early Todd McFarlane. Yeah, with his uh, his pencils and Tony DeZuniga's inks, I believe. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, no, awesome piece. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Really happy with this one. And you, we mentioned this piece a little bit earlier, too, that Ghost Rider. I featured it in the CAF update. Uh, yes. I didn't have good words about to say, like, why, but I love, you know, honestly, I love the just, this is a nostalgic piece for me, but, you know, putting a, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a cool guy on a horse against uh, the ghost rider on a, on a motorcycle running down an alley. I mean, just all, all of this imagery uh, together, it's just such a dynamic image from, uh, from, from ghost rider. I, I love this piece. I love the black cat in it. I mean, um, yeah. I, I thought the exact same thing. And then, again, this is a part of it. I, I, I took a picture of this when I got it and I sent it to my brother. I'm like, remember getting this comic? And he goes, like, oh, my God, I can't believe you have that. And this is <laughs> bad for us. We read, you know, we, we, would, we would get on our bikes and we would go around the neighborhood and collect uh, Coke bottles and other bottles because you could take them to 7-Eleven and they would give you change uh, if you turned in the bottles. And that's how we got money to buy comic books. And what, what I, we had struggled and we we would argue and try to pick which comic we both wanted because they were both of our money and this was what the one that we got and we read it over and over and over and over again and um so this is this is not only a nostalgic pick for me it's also a character that I, I i like a lot um so originally you know I, i've heard now as i've gotten older a lot of people thought that this was going to be the original ghost rider who was on the on the horse behind him and it turned out not to be that. But uh, I think that would have been an interesting twist. I, I wonder if they had ever thought of doing that. Uh, you know, the funny thing about that's the first thing I thought when I saw this cover too. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it would make sense. But yeah, they didn't. But um, but I had the same thing. Whenever I'd go to my grandmother's house, she, you know, bottles of Pepsi, RC, mm -hmm. uh, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. She would, there, there'd usually be like six or eight of the, the six packs waiting for me when I got there. And uh I would have to carry them all down to the grocery store to get my dimes and I'd go over to the 7-Eleven and buy comic books and candy. So yeah, yeah it was like every other week I went to, I couldn't yeah. wait to get to my grandma's house for that reason. Uh, that funny? Oh yeah. It, no, it's, it, it's, it is, but I mean, kids today, they don't know how good they got. It. <laughs> you know, no. you know, you know, work for that stuff, man. Oh dude, we I would have to go around. So we're nice enough. I had made deals with the other people in the neighborhood that I would take their trash and put it at the curb and they would give me all their bottles and our biggest disaster was my because we had to get on our bicycles because the seven was just a little too far to walk and my brother dropped one of the things of, of uh, bottles and shattered everywhere and i was so upset with him Woo. i don't i don't think how I'm many comics he just blew that. for us bro what <laughs> How many comics you weren't able to buy because he dropped? I them. know because of him. I, I should call him right now and rip on him again. <laughs> yeah, so so hurt him. you haven't forgiven him yet for it. No, I will never forgive him for that. Oh uh, man, well, switching switching back here uh, to some DC. Lovely image again. Now, is this something uh, that you've had for a while, or is it a? Yes, I've had this one for a long time. Um, this was the cover to Batman Animated Annual Number One. And I really wanted a piece with, um, I wanted an original by Bruce Tim, and I've now gotten a few of them, but this one was just so perfect. It had Joker, Harley, Scarecrow, uh, the ventriloquist in it. And this to me was a great representation of Bruce's art. Uh, you know, again, he doesn't often draw anything larger than um, eight and a half by 11. So for him to do a few things that were comic related, like this, I, I jumped all over it. And I, I'm just a huge fan of his art. I like the cleanliness of it. It, it, it reminds me a little bit, I, I don't want to say it reminds me of Mannix, but it has this cartoony, but almost sinister and very really cool way he does. I, I mean, it's hard. To, it's one of those ones where it is hard for me to describe it, but very clean and uh, really with a few lines can convey so much with these characters. I mean, it's just crazy. Yeah, very true. I'm sorry, I'm reading the chat. Marcus said uh, when we were talking about kids having to, you know, take 
Coke bottles in for their dimes. Marcus says kids have to prepare dueling dealers slides these days. Yeah, so <laughs> that is what my kids do, but they're not buying comic books with uh, with that money, yeah. uh, as far as I know. But uh, but I, I agree. this is a great image, and I, I was just looking at your calf. You you've had this thing uh, on calf since two thousand six. No, there you go. Yeah, and, and a lot of times I don't post stuff right when I get it, especially because I'm really super lazy. And uh, but now I'm getting better about it. But so I may have had this one, frankly, for a few years before that. I don't remember where I got it. Wow, no, it's a uh, that's a fantastic piece, man. Um, no, let's see here. Uh, next up, um, wow, you got uh, JLA and JSA all on one page. And that's yes, fantastic. By the late great Carlos Pacheco, uh, he was a, a, a true talent, and uh, you know it, this was. Um, a, a, I loved always. It's kind of like when you had any crossovers with Marvel or DC. Seeing the two teams come together was always so awesome for me. Uh, I just thought it was terrific. You know, having two Green Lanterns, two Flashes. You know, it just was always really fun and and the one thing that always i loved about this piece is you had plastic man in the very back as a tie fighter but in the published comic it's he's like a jet or something because uh they couldn't get permission from lucas arts to have the tie fighter so they had to redo it <laughs> i didn't even notice that, that funny. But yeah yeah I, mean, I, I love plastic man plastic man is such a great again another great character there was one series in jla and I can't remember what it was anymore, where Batman figures out that Plastic Man is the most powerful of all of them. And he's the most dangerous of all the superheroes, which I thought was funny. Um, so he, 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 he kind of put a different spin on that character as well. And I loved how Dr. Fate's cape is going the opposite direction of everybody else's cape. So that was always a cool piece, too, because he's the Lord of Order, so he can do whatever he wants with his cape. Mm hmm keep it out of the way so you can see power girl more effectively <laughs> nick was commenting on that you know you're always your eyes are always drawn to that uh, that that focal point but absolutely uh, but yeah pacheco uh you know was amazing i uh i own a few pieces by by him and i'm, I'm glad that i do i mean he's he was an incredible talent and definitely uh somebody again that we've lost in the last few years too many too many great artists uh have mm -hmm. uh have left us way too early but um yeah but you, yeah, you, you have a couple pieces, you have a couple pieces not you have another piece you have like a superman cover i think i think in your mm -hmm. calf gallery maybe uh equally as awesome yes he he was a great one, one of the things that he could do is he could have again more of a simplistic kind of drawing style where everything looks very very clean but you know in the the other even this one is very detailed you look at the little details on every character is is drawn very well has their own posing their own character you know even adam at the very front is you know leaping over that piece of debris it's just really cool how he could do all this and still keep all the lines so great i mean it's just perfect he, he was a true talent agreed now uh this next piece i think i saw on your back wall oh yes mm -hmm. by Adi. This piece, I, I don't normally buy a lot of what I would call kind of cheesecake uh, uh, photos and, and pictures of girls like this, even though I love beautiful women. But when I saw this piece, um, it just struck me. This is one of those pieces in, uh, by Addy Granov, and I've actually, I talked to him uh, at the last San Diego Comic-Con about this piece. Um, I don't know what he had in his head, but this is a perfect, almost a perfect image the way the viewer is slightly below her and she has this regal, almost arrogant look to her um, and her, the placement of her hand, the flow of her cape. It's just a terrific piece that kind of pulls you into it. Um, and it's very seductive, alluring, but almost cold kind of detached kind of way that I think is perfect for uh, Scarlet Witch. Um, just a really lovely, well, well drawn piece. Uh, that showed, and, and Addy was kind of starting off at this point. He's gotten to be, a, over the years, he's gotten to be a significantly better artist. And this is where I, one of those pieces, I think, where he transitioned. A lot of times when he was drawing Iron Man, they were very cold and mechanical and didn't have a lot of life to him. This piece, I think, is was a turning point for him. Well, I, I would have to agree. I mean, it's, it, I love uh, Addy's work. And this one, though, 
it's just it's perfect as a tonal piece too i mean there's yes. a, it's just it's so beautifully rendered i mean you and he does most of his stuff in color so it's nice to see this you know you think of like anacleto and a, and a few others that maybe kind of come close to this but yeah this this is this is amazing and it was a published cover too it wasn't a yeah, it wasn't when i bought it it was uh oh it wasn't oh no, it was not a published cover when i bought it and then uh, a few years after i bought it um it, it became a variant cover but uh the funny thing is is that one of the things addy and i talked about is that he went back and I didn't know it was him, so I accidentally insulted him. But I said, you know, I, I love this piece, and we're talking about it for a little bit. And I've talked to him a few times. He's a really nice guy. And um, I said, you know, but I really hate the way it was colored. He goes, you know, I do too, and I colored it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, bud. I said, I think you did it. I said, look, I'm, I'm being honest with you. But he went back and digitally colored it, obviously, and it just didn't didn't look good. It, it just didn't. And, and so he and I talked about it for a little bit and he said, you know, he was kind enough to not insult me to my face and say, get away from me, you jerk. Uh, but we did talk about it for a little bit, but it's really much more impressive like this than it is the color version, I think. Definitely. Well, we all make those kind of mistakes, but uh, that's, what, yeah. that's what happens when you're able to talk to uh, to the creators. You know, you can. Well, no, he was, I, I'm very honest with these guys. You know, I talk to a lot of them and I'll be honest with you, as long as you don't say it most mischievously or meanly, they're pretty good about taking. I wouldn't even say that was criticism. It was just a comment on how great the original artwork was and how I felt that the coloring didn't pay tribute to what he had done. And he and I probably said it almost exactly like that. And so he understood that I wasn't trying to be mean to him. And he took it in the spirit in which I said it. And we had a really nice talk. I mean, and, you know, so we'll see. Maybe he'll 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 ignore me next time when I see him. <laughs> oh, man, you never know. But uh, next piece, this next piece uh, might be my favorite uh, DC artwork in your calf gallery. This, oh. uh, this Dick Sprang, uh, you know, Secrets of the Batcave piece. I mean, it's just unbelievable, you know, I, mean, it is. Uh, uh, I don't even know what's the size on something like this. It's gigantic. It's 24 inches by 36 inches. Wow. It's very, very big. And it, it you know, I have, uh, I was, uh, Ike Wilson, who is a big, was a very good friends with Dick Sprang and uh, was kind enough to contact me and send me some um, in progress pictures of this as he is, as, as uh, Dick Spring was drawing it. Um, and uh, Dick Spring is one of those artists, unlike some of the other guys, never lost his artistic ability. From the day he started to the day he died, he could draw exactly like he always did. And uh, he was just terrific. And when I, I had bought, this was a series of prints that were done by graffiti something or other, graffiti press, I think. And they did this one and they did the Guardians of Gotham piece. And there was actually supposed to be a third piece which was Joker's belt. And I actually have that one as well. I own that one as well, the original that one as well. And um, this piece though was just so amazing for the reasons I think you'll agree with is that every little detail and every little bit of Batman, you know, fan service. And I mean, just everything is in this piece. You have all the characters, you have a, a nod to Bill Finger, you know, I mean, just everybody was here. I mean, he, he, put little things into people that I just thought were so impressive um, that, you know, I've looked at it for so many times that I probably have seen everything now, but, you know, I, I always wonder if I miss something because it's got so much detail to it and it's perfect. There's not a speck of white out on it. There's nothing. He did. He did everything perfectly. It's crazy. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, everybody's well, everybody's Sean and uh, Derek mentioned, you know, the, the litho, uh yeah it's just hard to imagine you know so you're so familiar with the litho that you you know you don't think the original is around but you've got it right here i mean that's yeah. uh, that's amazing it, that is and that's another piece i had tried to buy many years ago and it was owned by he a dentist owned the two pieces and i i don't even know who the guy's real name but i actually called him and uh, he wanted a certain sum of money for both of them which was far 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 less then I bought this one piece for many years later. <laughs> if only I had the money at the time, but at the time it was a tremendous amount of money to me. Uh, and it still is. But uh, the uh, I, I was lucky enough to acquire this one at the same time I acquired some of those other ones. And that was kind of my big hurrah. And that was my last year I've ever spent that much money. But uh, 
it was, and I was lucky enough to have a very understanding wife who supported me in this journey and let me um, not sleep outside for a while for this one. But uh, I absolutely love this and, and the combination of pieces. Like I said, I, I didn't used to like Dick Springs. I always thought Dick Springs was talented, but I didn't like the smiling Batman. I used to think that, but this is such a, he really was a, ter a terrific artist who brought again another stamp to the character that's that everybody copies. I mean, the, the Dick Sprang style is something that if you see it, it, it's his own unique way of drawing that no one else does. Or I shouldn't say no one else does, but no one else did. And so they copied it, you know, for Emmett, for episodes of uh, Batman or yeah, Batman, the animated series, they did, a, they did a um, take off of a Dick Sprang uh, style um, episode. Well, like I said, this is probably my favorite DC artwork in your calf. I mean, clearly uh, it's one of yours too. You can just tell. I mean, yes, I, I, I just absolutely love this piece. It's one of my favorite by far. And there's other, it's so funny. That's the way I think a lot of collectors are. It's not the most expensive piece in my gallery that's important to me. It's the one that brings me the most joy. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is certainly not the most expensive, but it brings me a lot of joy. Well, and then uh, we transition to this, you know, Sprang style to uh, Bevan style. And this, yes, this was more of a study in architecture, you know, and with Batman included in it. But that's what makes it so special. Right. Batman's almost not an afterthought. He is not the focus of the piece. And you kind of catch him over in the corner. And to me, this was, again, kind of a more of a definitive Batman piece, because that's what you would expect, is that you wouldn't notice Batman right away. He would be up in the shadows. He would be lurking. He would be blending in. And so you kind of almost your eye would almost pass over him. And when you see him, you're like, oh, there's Batman. But this piece is, and the Harley Quinn piece that, uh, uh, and I don't know, and I've said this before, I wish I knew who this artist was. I know his name isn't really Ape Bevan. I think that was just a pseudonym that he went by. And he mm -hmm. died a few years ago, before, right before, this image was apparently supposed to be published, but it didn't get published. And um, he died, and I don't know how or anything about him, but I would love to know more about the guy if anybody ever knows. But this piece is so detailed. If you, and when you see the piece in real life, in, in the shadowy areas, uh, in the architecture, you can actually see in there. And there's detail inside of those shadowed areas that no one would ever see or even care about. And he filled all that in. It's crazy. No, it's, a, it's a masterpiece. It's beautiful. I mean, yeah. That's I what I call it, a Batman masterpiece. That, that, that's exactly how I have it. Yeah. It, it, right. to me, it, and it's, it's, it's a complementary piece to that Perez uh you know with the scope shot earlier where oh, it's you so know, I never thought about it. It. right yeah uh, all about the architecture and then there's batman uh yeah, yeah. no it's fantastic it's beautiful thank you yeah i just can't even imagine how long it took him to draw this it's just great and, and talk about tonal art the the marble looks like marble i mean he drew it in a way that it really looks like a marble sculpture i mean it's just terrific I uh, I completely agree, and the lighting on it—I mean, it's it's beautiful. It's hard to imagine. It's unreal. There you go, James. James has captured it. That's what I'm looking for. It is unreal. Yeah. Hard to yes. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this is one that I just absolutely love, and and I think it's just artistically so so terrific. I just get no end of pleasure just looking at it. Sure. So thank you for showing it to me again. I like it. We have uh, we spoke about this artist earlier, and uh, now we're looking at Smart by Alex Ross. Yes, I, I I really like this piece a lot. And one of the things that I love about it is is that at the top he did the panels like playing cards, and so it tells the story of Joker's origin in a few very simple images. And I thought that was great, and I and I, and I thought that Alex really by toning down his style a little bit and really kind of amping up the storytelling of his pieces really did a terrific job with this piece. I mean, it just, it's great. And I love the, the hand smashing the mirror with the cracks. I mean, it just really shows the, you know, but basically it's showing Joker losing his mind and cracking up and stuff like this. It's just, it's a really good alternative to the Brian Boland image of him going ha 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 and grabbing his face. This is just a wonderful image. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, you know, most of what Al Alex puts out is always well thought out and well constructed. Right. I mean, it seems I don't know how he does it because, you know, there's so 
so few flaws in in his work when he when he's doing a book or you know that he he has to have i mean and i've never really read a lot of, about his process but uh nobody you know kind of just renders everything uh, you know to the detail and to to capture all the right tones as 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 he does i mean and, and so this is just an amazing amazing he does a lot of a lot of lot with models so he will have a model and then he snaps pictures of them or or does drawings in real time and that's why he has he had a model that was superman and a lot of people have complained about a superman looks old the model he had was kind of a barrel chested weightlifter guy who bore a resemblance to superman a little bit older guy and so he sometimes draws he's he sometimes draws too closely to what he's taken a picture of or something like this and so when he stretches that and gets into an area where maybe somebody else he's painting over somebody else's pencils you sometimes mm -hmm. get a lot more of of alex's art true artistic ability than sometimes when he does stuff that i think is more based on models that makes sense yeah and he and he does very tight pencil pieces a lot of times and then he'll sit down and paint from his pencils it's, it's he he has a very interesting process he, very 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 talented guy he, he definitely brought another level of artistic um what's the word of excellence i guess is the black for better to comics i remember walking to a comic book store and they had a cover of wizard magazine that he had done with batman and superman on it, it may have been his very first published piece one of them and no i had never seen that before where people had drawn the characters like they would really as if these were real human beings but you know sometimes they would draw them wearing costumes and it looks like a guy wearing spandex and so it looks stupid but this he drew them in a way that made them still look heroic and like those costumes worked for that mm -hmm. and i think that was a true testament to him because he would draw superman wearing the full superman costume and he pulled it off like christopher reeve could pull it off and it just looked terrific you didn't look at Christopher Reeve and go, that guy looks stupid in that costume. Look at that guy going, that's eh, Superman. I mean, it's crazy. I completely agree. Now, uh, switching to a, another gentleman who's well known for his painting, mm -hmm. got Steve Rude. Unmistakable. Yeah. That's, yeah. Like, it's so dynamic. I mean, he didn't need to add so many figures in here, but that that just adds to the uh to the you know the overall just insanity that's happening on this dock right just having all these extra characters in there but uh the lighting on batman is uh you know is is very dynamic and you only get to, you know he's covering his face i mean you don't need it you know this is all about the action this is like a pulp magazine cover and it's done so darn well well, if you follow the flow of the action, which is interesting, it took me a long, it took me a little bit to figure it out. Batman's actually kicking the guys in front of him, but he's throwing, he's just thrown the guy over his shoulder behind him. And that's why his arms in that position kind of covering his face. And he's getting ready to come down with a fist and punch whoever's still not on the ground. And, but you, the things that he did in this piece were just so terrific to the limit of having the rope and having the guy reaching up and grabbing Batman's calf with the cigar laying in his hands. And, you know, just like you said, the, all the, the the scuba tanks, but also having the pink rays of light coming out of the back of the city. To, and you don't even notice, but it adds a level of dynamism to the piece that it's so terrific. And you just really get this sense of flowing movement. And, and I just thought it was such, a, a, this is, you know, again, another piece that is terrific, a really, a, a, um, is a phenomenal example. Example, pardon me, of Steve Rude's at the top. Of, Steve Rude at the top of his game. I mean, this is just a, a, a beautiful piece. I just think it's terrific in every way. Yeah, I mean, like I, that beating the shit out of Nazis. That's always, <laughs> that always gives me a lot of pleasure, right there. Uh huh. That's why Indiana Jones is so popular. But yeah, I mean, you keep look. I, I keep my eye keeps going around and around on this thing, and, it, and it, I never get. I haven't gotten bored yet. You know, right? Uh, just like you said, the rope around the one guy's neck. I mean, Batman's taking care of business here in so many different different ways. Is he beating the crap out of these people? This is awesome. Yeah, and it just it, and to imagine this, to, and to imagine it, and then to execute the drawing. And in the perspective that it is so that you everybody ha everybody can be seen 
and every sense of motion can be seen. And just every little tiny detail, the water, the boat in the background, the, the, the newspapers flying around, the, the smoke coming off the cigar, the way that the guy, again, it's grabbing Batman's calf and you can see the pressure of his fingers on Batman's calf. I mean, it just, it, it really was one of those things where I think just Steve Root put a lot of time, effort and attention into this piece, uh, which makes it terrific. And the other thing I like is that sometimes Steve does Batman's ears where they go off to the side like a Harlequin's helmet. And here he decided to keep his ears up. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Do you know what year this was done? Rich Danny's wants to know. You know, I, 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 I'll be honest with you. And so I'm going to tell you what my opinion is. So take it for what it's worth. Steve's style has slightly changed over the years and his painting has become looser and kind of not as cohesive and not as detailed with the tonality and the, and the coloring as this piece is. <clears throat> and so my guess is this is much older than when I bought it. I, my guess is this is a mid nineties piece, but I could be completely wrong. Steve lives here. I've met him. I used to represent him. I know him. Um, and, uh, I haven't talked to him in, in, in many, many years, but, uh, my guess is this is more along that, that period of time, just from looking at it, but, who knows? He may have done it in the in the mid two thousands, which is about when I bought it. Uh, maybe uh, yeah, two thousand ten or so. I think I've had it somewhere around there. And um, my guess is that it was much older than that. All right. Well, it's uh, it is an amazing piece. I love Steve's work. Yeah. yeah, me too. I think he's another great talent. John Basima. Changing gears. Go ahead, John. I'm, I'm sorry, Bill. Oh, no, no, no. I was like, uh, you, I'll let you start. Well, I was just going to say, I, I was so thrilled to get this piece because I'm a huge John Basima Avengers fan, but I'm also, the, the Vision is one of my favorite characters. And again, he's another character that's hard to get a good, uh, for me, I haven't been able to find, a, well, I've, there's other been examples, I'm sure that, that, are, that are out there, but this is one of the better examples I've found of him. And I love the the, the, the story of this with um, Quicksilver using his speed to kind of deflect Captain America's shield. And I love that top image of uh, Cap throwing a shield because I just love Cap throwing a shield. And then he goes, you know, you and the way he says it, the dialogue is so perfect here that I know more about your power powers than you uh, know of those of the vision. I mean, it's such a powerful, wonderfully written uh, story and it just tells you everything you need to see in this one pant in this one page. So it's just a great piece for me of one of my favorite characters. Yeah, with uh, great Tom Palmer inks on it as well. Yes, it's fantastic. Yeah, no, I mean this is this is great. I wouldn't mind having this one in my collection. Well, we can talk. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I have to keep this one because until I can get a better vision, uh, uh -huh. Sam, keep this one for a while. All right, we're swinging back to DC here, Justice Society cover. And, uh, uh, you know, I never was a big Justice Society fan. Well, DC was always tough for me, but this, this is a pretty nice image. I mean, it's just, uh, as far as the specter goes, I mean, I, I, think, I think this is a, it's, a, it's a great image. There's just something about the specter and, like I said, the magical part of, probably stemming from my love of Dungeons and Dragons, but of these characters where, you know, the specter is the wrath of God and you have Dr. Fate is the Lord of light and they have kind of these combating um, power structures, but they're just so, so cool. But I got this when I was a lawyer at the time and I just love this, that it's America versus the justice league. So this had everything. And I do like the justice society a lot because I think we owe so much to these characters as the precursor to what we love. These guys started it all. I mean, you know, they, they were, they formed the templates for a lot of things that characters went for doing from this point forward. Some of them are silly and some of them don't make a lot of sense, but that's also one of the reasons why we like them. So it is just a really cool piece for me. Yeah. And I like the inspectors commanding what I think is the judge to do whatever he wants to do. And that would be my dream. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> ah, so so it's the law tie in for you. It's the, it's that's the right. courtroom drama. Um, That's exactly right. <laughs> this was Barry Ordway too, by the way. I, I, I should yes, say. yes. But, uh, but yeah, no, great, great, uh, great piece here. Nick Nick Rucci says, Jared, 
Uh, we'll need to talk trading my Jesco vision for something with you if you're interested. I love your calf. Oh, that's very nice. Well, I, I, I'm hoping to hook up with Nick at uh, San Diego, so I'd love to do that. Nick, you feel free to reach out to me whenever you want. Cool. Well, we have, uh, let's see, two more pieces to look at here. And uh, next up is a, a DPS by Mr. Finch. Yeah. This one was, I was lucky to, uh, Rob Gomez was lucky. It was was kind enough to sell me this piece. And uh, I'm a huge fan of David Finch's. Again, another, I, I, I don't know if you can even say he's a new artist anymore, but the style he brings, the perspective, and I love Scarecrow. Scarecrow is such an underrated character for Batman. But what really sold me on this piece of all things was the way Batman's cape is devolving into bats. I just loved that detail that that he put in there they didn't have to put in and this is kind of you can't tell because unfortunately the the black and white piece doesn't show it but the the circles over on the right hand side are actually his mother's pearls and uh so uh he just had a lot of images in here from batman and i thought what a great image of one of batman's wonderful foes who's all about fear and what does batman fear because he's this, he's almost like a daredevil character, the man without fear. He fears nothing. He goes into these extraordinarily dangerous situations with these incredibly insane human people. And this guy's showing everything that Batman fears, and he fears the death of his parents. You see the death of the of his supporting cast over there, and you know, and Gotham. It, Gotham is there. So this is everything that I thought, again, was a great just indicative of the Batman mythos all kind of in one piece with obviously the Joker's card being a big piece of this too. So eh, it's just a great piece. Oh yeah. No, uh, um, it's fantastic. And again, you, you know, you're you getting to know Rob Gomez is what allowed you to have the opportunity to pick this. I up. didn't know Rob until I knew until I bought this piece from him. And then he and I started chatting and he and I have a lot of similarities in what we like. He likes, Dungeons and Dragons, a lot of the same artwork, stuff like this. And and plus, he's just a super, super nice guy with an amazing collection. So um, I don't have as good a hair or a beard as he does, but he is uh, a certainly, a, a definitely, and or a collection as good as him. But he is a very, very nice guy. And he, now he has my Daredevil Finch piece. So we traded. Oh, well, that worked out. But yes. So you, got, you, 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 I don't know, you, you did pretty well with this one. Um, Thank you. Now, uh, the last piece is it's staying with DC, but we have this Gary Frank Superman Secret Origins cover. And, um, I, you know, Gary Frank, I, I, his, his version of Superman, the Christopher Reeve kind of feel is just, it, it was just perfect. You know, I mean, I, 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 every time I see a Superman piece by Gary, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm floored. I love, cause I love Gary's work, but I think he just had a certain, uh, affection for the, for that, for, for Christopher Reeve as Superman. And he moved it, you know, and he just worked it so well. Uh, yeah, and, and this piece, it's, 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 it's crazy. It's beautiful. I mean, and the, the cityscape behind them too. I mean, it's just a wonderful composition. It really, it, it, one of the things I, I've become a huge fan of Gary Frank's art, Frank Quietly's art. Um, I, I think that they are both tremendously gifted. And like I said before, Christopher Reeve is my Superman. And mm -hmm. the way that he paid him tribute here in multiple ways, not just um, the facial image of, uh, of him, but if you look, you know, Lois Lane is holding on to him for dear life and her, her, like her sandals hanging off the bottom of her heel. And, you know, Superman is just gently holding her, but the expression on his face and the expression on her face is what sells it. She's got this look of fear and she's holding on him and he's like, I got you, no problem. And, and this instilling in her calm and he's, I mean, it just, that was just one. And even, even the postures of their body where Superman is very relaxed and his hands just kind of out and he's gently holding her around the waist. That to me was masterfully done. I mean, it just, it, that's the kind of stuff that I think that people don't think of when they look at the piece, but the artist clearly had to think about, about those things. So it makes yeah. me like these pieces more. Yeah, no, I agree. It's uh, it, it, it's it's wonderful, and I and yeah, Gary's. Uh, I've just always admired his work. He has an interesting attention to detail. Uh, we don't get to see him too much anymore because he's in. I think he lives in Italy now. But um, 
but yeah, he's he's somebody that would be cool to get to the states sometime to see because I've never met him in person, but I've all you know I've always admired his stuff. I, you know, I've I've never met him. I don't even think I really know what he looks like. I mean, but he is. I've liked a lot. He did a comic years ago. I think I can't remember what it was called, but uh, I think J. Michael Straczynski wrote it. I think it was called Midnight Suns or something like this. And that was the first time I came. No, no, it was it was uh, the new take on the Squadron Supreme. He mm. he drew that, and I think Michael J. Straczynski was writing. And if I'm wrong, please somebody in the chat will correct me. But uh, that was the first time his kind of artwork came to my attention, and I was just floored. He was drawing these really gruesome images, and then he would have other images with these just beautiful women and these dynamic action scenes and stuff like this. He just was terrific. He just really kind of caught my eye, and, and really, I just think he's a terrific. Like I said, even in that piece the way he's got the body language of the characters and it says the whole thing about the whole piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the whole piece. Superman, and it's all, it just, I'm glad he didn't use Margot Kidder for Lois Lane, though, I have to say that. No, <laughs> no offense to the late Margot Kidder. But and Rick Welch had the, had the quote, you're holding me, but who's holding you? <laughs> I also have the piece from the comic where he, where he catches, you know, which I don't have in my calf, I don't think, but where he, gra where he catches the, the helicopter. Mm-hmm. So I'll have to put that piece in my cap. But yes, that's uh, to me that was always the most the most wonderful scene ever. And, and again, you're holding me. Who's holding you? For, what is that? Forty years ago. Mm -hmm. And that line, you know, you'll believe a man can fly. I mean, that shaped everything. It did. It yeah. really did. Yeah. Oh man. Uh, well, you know, I, I'm, I've been browsing through your calf gallery too while we're talking. You've got so much great art, man. <laughs> it's it's, oh, it's almost criminal. And like you just you're saying, you know, like you don't post everything up there, but you know, your Barry Windsor Smith uh, Thor cover, uh, the Paulo Rivera Ghost Rider cover. You got an Earl Norum, uh, you know, Conan cover. Shoot. I mean, you can go on and on. you even have a Felipe Massafera uh, trial of Magneto cover. I mean, all these things are just yeah. it's insane. So uh, I hope everybody takes the time to go back and look through your, your, your cap cover. You even have another great Dick Sprang uh, Batman piece. So those are yeah, those two pieces kind of go together. They, they yeah. were they were companion pieces, and the and the Joker piece that's in there was supposed to be the third, and it just never the, the graffiti press. They were doing these super incredibly high quality prints of his mm -hmm. art, and they frankly put themselves out of business because they they spent so much on producing quality pieces they couldn't they didn't have enough of a markup but yeah really really lovely i i, I congratulate them because they did really brought so much joy to people everybody who's got one of those prints should appreciate it they did a great job on it right all right well yeah well jared man this has been a lot of fun i'll tell you, Thank you I, I learned i learned a great deal i think about uh your collection you know, we'll have to uh do it again Next time i'll put more marvel in yeah sure. yeah i don't know it doesn't matter. i don't mind it's all art at the end of the day you know as long as you know you're not focused on the characters it's all it doesn't matter i mean again i'm you have a you have a dave dorman painting a batman painting that's that was the first it's funny because dave and i are friends and i'll just tell real quickly when i was in the warner brothers store he had done that that was part of a card set mm -hmm. and i saw that picture and i bought the cards so I could have that one card. And that was the very first time I ever realized really, and I told Dave this, how fine the art could be, mm -hmm. how wonderful this, this painting, because that image is striking. It and is. so I went to Dave and I said, do you still have this? And he did. And luckily I, he was kind enough to sell it to me. And um, I, I treasure that piece because it, Dave and I became friends and I, and I liked that piece a lot, but um, yeah. Yeah, no, I've always liked Dave's work, and uh, yeah, but see, that's 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 cool. Another good story, tied Thank back you. to the Warner Brothers story too. Well, not only that, but you know, it's one of those situations where I got to meet somebody who did something that brought joy to my life, and turned mm -hmm. out that the person was better than the art that he does, and that sometimes doesn't happen. I can say so. I've met other artists who I will not name, who unfortunately their art was way better than they are in person. <laughs> Right. They can't, they, you know, they can't all be perfect. No, 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 no. Don't meet your heroes as the saying goes. 
exactly. If you don't want to, you know, be unhappy about it, but, uh, but that doesn't happen too often, but they're, they're out there, they're out there and everybody can have a bad day. You know, I would think that going to, going to cons on a regular basis would probably jade a lot of uh, creators, you know, I mean, especially in this day and age, but even back in the day, you know, it's, you were kind of forced into doing it. Maybe you weren't on your best behavior. I don't know. Who well, knows? Uh, I, well, and part of it is that I, I represent some of these guys and um, one of the always things I see is lawyers, doctors, some other pe professionals, psychologists, you get to see what uh, people are doing when no one's looking. <laughs> and I get to see sometimes in all walks of life what people do when no one's looking. And so I know who they sometimes who I wouldn't associate with on a personal level and even though I have to represent them. And sometimes I see somebody try to do all the right things at every step and it still didn't help them. And those are the people who I think have true kindness in them and are still good people. So it's, 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 it's a pleasure to represent. And most of the comic artists I've met are like that. Mm -hmm. The funny thing is, is that I'll tell the story. I've probably told it before, but I met John Basima right before he died. Like it was the very first or second comic con I went to. And John was talking about how he hated drawing superheroes. He thought it was the worst thing ever. He didn't understand them. They thought, he thought, I can't understand what this is. I, I don't have any connection with this. He liked drawing Conan and he liked drawing Thor, but he didn't like drawing any of the other ones. And he was very honest about it and very open about it. And that's what a lot of these artists did in the beginning. They were kind of failed artists. They thought that they were doing basically the next level up from drawing coloring books. Mm -hmm. They never thought like we saw it. It didn't matter to them because they were adults and they didn't have any connection to any of these characters. It was just a job for them. And that's why a lot of them never had any concept that their art would ever be worth anything. And some of the artists, if you look at some of the art, it's awful. I mean, it's just not even good. Uh, but they were what we grew up with and they're, you know, made our, like we talked about, they built us into the people we are. Mm -hmm. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. So they deserve a lot of kudos for that. Couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, sorry. That was my soapbox. I'm off now. All right. Well, Jared, I appreciate you taking the time tonight. I'm sorry it wasn't last night, and I'm sorry I uh, got got everybody else worked up about the uh, the the wrong schedule. But we we got it all worked out. We had a, we had a had a I had a lot of fun talking with you tonight, Jared. I mean, it's uh, we sh we should have done this. With even we could the you know the few times I've gotten to see you shows, it's 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 that's the the worst thing about shows. You tend to not have a lot of time to to get to right. get to know anybody uh, like your friend George. Uh, hopefully at some point I'll get him on here and we can talk a bit more because, you know, I bumped into him at a few shows and I clearly you know, hung out in his cap gallery a lot. But again, you don't get to know collectors too often. You get to know them like Scott Wingo always says. It's like I, I can tell a lot about a collector by the stuff they collect and what pieces they choose to feature. And so that's kind of how we get to know one another yeah. uh, by and large. But, you know, having the time to actually talk with uh, with a collector, is, it, you know, is, is a lot of fun. And, and it's a little different than just browsing and trying to see, you know, try to understand a collector based on what, what creators they like and the pieces they choose to collect. And you were always an interesting one because of the intro about the, you know, Michael Whalen and the Elric stuff. So, uh, you know, that added a wrinkle that always made me curious. Well, I appreciate that very much. And Bill, like I said, I, I, at some point I told you in the green room, I want to interview you. I think that it would be lovely to have a moment where you get to talk about your collection and what you like and what you you think and how you started CAF and get into a lot of areas like that. I think it'd be fun. And I think it would be um, hopefully a good experience for you to be grilled by me. Hey, you're a lawyer. You, you <laughs> might <laughs> have to get out I of here. I might have to plead the fifth a few times. I, you know, I, I don't do criminal law, but I would love to have you plead the fifth whenever. If I ask you a question good enough that you have to plead the fifth, Everybody's going to be chatting about it the next day. Right. So that would be, be <laughs> that <is> so true. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! All right, Jerry. Well, listen. Uh, you know, thanks for doing this. Everybody in the chat, thank you for hanging out with us tonight. This is a lot of fun, and uh, you know, we've got um, uh, I've got a full slate. I got you know, I got dueling dealers tomorrow and a cap update on uh, on uh, Thursday. But I've got Paper Chaser, who's been on cap for about as long as you have, Jared. I've got him. Yeah. He's in the UK, so we had to do a Saturday afternoon interview. So I'm I'm looking forward to uh, to talking with him because he's had a very uh, interesting career as a collector. You know, he's you know good friends with some of these artists, but you know, can go to their house and and hang out and spend spend the weekend kind of thing. Uh, so I'm I've, and I've never talked to him, 
but just just from looking through his calf and getting to know what things he collects that's what intrigued me about uh, talking with him and so i've learned just enough to make it's it's going to be you know it's gonna be a fun fun chat with somebody that i'm going in cold yeah, not, not uh, I'll tell you, I'd love to see, I'd lo and I, I don't know if you care, but I, a, I'm looking forward to seeing George on here because that'll be fun. I'll tease him in the chat. But number two is, is that I'd love to see Bill Johnson. Uh, if you ever could get him. I have asked. He's, His collection is jaw dropping. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he gets probably one of my favorite collections on cat by far. Yeah, no, I, I haven't asked him in a while, but I mean, when I, I remember asking him and during, during the pandemic and, I think he turned me down. I can't remember the exact reason. I mean, some people don't like to get on camera, right? Or they have jobs yeah. that put them in a position where they don't want to have uh, their their name on a YouTube recording. And I get, I, you know, I get it. And I don't know if that was Bill's reason or not. But uh, but yeah, no, I'll go back and ask him. I mean, we we he and I have emailed numerous times over the years. I mean, he's got one of my favorite collections on the site, right? I mean, probably, yeah. arguably, he might have more per our artwork comments left you know uh you know that aren't any of his own than anyone else on calf because he i think he's you know he always seems to win the most commented piece every year and uh and deservedly so to be honest right i mean he has one of the most admired collections on the site i mean you, you know we, we always talk about you know dave mandel and a few other people who have just spectacular collections but bill yeah. kind of low-key guy but easily you know one of one of the best collections on the site have so, you ever had nick I, I i don't want to call nick out in this because i know he's on the chat but have you ever had nick on i know he's got his own channel so like this but he's oh yeah no it was uh it's been a while i forget what nick we probably he, he might remember more than me but it was probably like two and a half years ago we, we did he a, is another person who has and i'm talking about him like he's not here but he has a terrific collection Oh yeah, I mean, he has stuff that I know he doesn't post. That is, I mean, I'm guessing because he talks about it. But I would love to see him uh, with some of his pieces because he is, and he's another person who has such a deep knowledge of uh, collecting and things like this. That mm -hmm. is terrific. You know, Dino, him, a few of the other guys, just really kind of know the history of the comics. I mean, I was listening to when you did your show with Dino, and I commented about it before. He knows the issue it came from. I mean, the history of the artist. I mean, it's fascinating to listen to this stuff. Oh yeah, I wish I had that depth of knowledge, but I don't. So they can. Yeah. It and, well, I don't either. That's why I like hanging out with people that do. I'm I'm not as much of a historian as uh, I wish I could be. I, I don't retain certain yes you know, that kind of stuff as well. Or I can't. I'm not going to remember. You know what? You know the, the things that these these guys do. And uh, no, that's uh, that's why uh, Dino's going to be on the show with me on Thursday. We're going to do like a small uh, heritage recap and. Um, probably talk for you know half hour 45 minutes or something but yeah I, I love the opportunities i get to hang out with those guys because it's just fun uh, you know dino's a great great presenter and he's uh he really is. yeah yeah yeah. Um, yeah you have, you, that's what that's what makes it fun because these guys aren't just sitting there like me i'm boring but these guys are interesting they have good facts to talk about i'm just saying i like batman up there he looks mm -hmm. good on that building the other body, everybody else, like, yeah, look at this. And you know, it came from this issue, and George was doing this, and da 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 da. And Wolfman was drawing that, you know. I mean, I was uh, writing this, I mean, they know everything. Mm -hmm. So, I'm more like you, I just like to listen. All right, well, listen, man, uh, we're gonna call it a night, but uh, thank, but again, you. thank you, Jared. This, this was great. So, you know, and uh, but we will have to do it again sometime. And um, well, maybe I'll get a chance to get lunch or something at San Diego. That's true. I am. I may be going to San Diego this year. I haven't. I have not confirmed it yet. But um, but it's Berkey's last year going. So I thought, well, I'll get an exhibitor badge if I go this year. Because after that, I might exactly. not. If I can't get an exhibitor badge, it probably won't be worth it for me to go. Mike um, says it was last year, but that's like Kiss saying it's their last tour. If he skips one year, he's screwed, right? I mean, trying to get back in. Unless he sublets, a lot of those guys sublet their booths, uh, mm -hmm. you know, but they still keep it in their name. So I guess he could do that, uh, yeah. so that it gives him the the opportunity to go back if he wants to. But um, but yeah, I think there's a few dealers who've said, you know, it's just getting a little less fun, right? I mean, as it, it gets more and more, uh, uh, you know, further away. Well, Marvel doesn't go anymore. DC didn't have a booth last year, mm -hmm. so we'll see. You know, uh, and Sideshow pulled out, so you know the. A lot of the big exhibitors are not going anymore. And truthfully, your show now is, you know, you had a really good response to that. Uh, New York has done well, so mm -hmm. they have a lot of competition. So who knows? Maybe I'll venture out to something else. Yeah. Rich Danny's mentioned Bud Planning. They, he stopped going, gosh, in what, like 2017 or something like that. So he's, yeah, yeah I get it. Um, all right, everybody. 
Now we're now I'm really saying good night. But uh, thanks again, Jared. Thanks everybody. We'll see you again soon. Have a good night. Thank you everybody. I appreciate.